interview. I tell you what, it's a Canadian audience, right? Yeah. Here's the only intro you need. I am the war correspondent that got Gerald Menard fired and reduced him right to Colonel. <laughs> Please do it. Okay, hang and on. I'll be like, Gerald Menard, I hope you're watching this, sir. All right. Hi, everyone, and thank you for watching. Typically, what I do is I write a lot. And at times, I've done some interviews with Canadians who have been involved in many different things. But over the last few days, I've had a very unique experience that I wanted to share with you. I've recently had the pleasure of meeting a couple of very interesting people, but the one I'm going to focus on is an American former Green Beret named Michael Yon. Michael has been spending a lot of time down in the Darien Gap in Panama. Michael has lived in almost a hundred different countries around the world. I had an opportunity to actually spend the last couple of days with Michael and Instead of being selfish and keeping that experience to myself, what I wanted to do while I had Michael here staying as a guest in my home was to interview Michael and to talk about many, many different things that impact not only the world or North America, but also Canadians. Michael has always been interested in what's happening in Canada, but right now he's starting to pay more specific attention. We had an opportunity to travel to Niagara Falls and to be into the Niagara region yesterday and learn some pretty interesting things. And so I'm hoping that you will watch this entire interview with myself and Michael because we really do cover a lot of ground. It is a long interview. You might want to do this in stages, but please be patient. Michael is a wealth of knowledge, especially for Canadians, and I think that you will find this interview very informative, very interesting. And I just want to say finally, thank you to Michael and Musako for coming here, being a guest in my home and sharing all of their life experiences that they have accumulated around the world, reporting on vitally important things that affect all of our lives. So thank you for watching this. And without further ado, let's meet Michael. Okay, Michael, thank you for agreeing to do this interview. We spent the last couple of days together, uh, me, you, Masako, and my significant other, who she's upstairs studying right now. But, you know, we, we spent a lot of time, spent, yesterday we spent a lot of time in the car, and we're going to get into that. But um, I do have a lot of questions. I, I, you know, I've done the intro for you already. But one thing I want to do before we start is I do want to give you a copy of my book. And Thank I you, sir. A, I wrote an inscription on the inside uh, for you and Masako because, you know, this is not just Canada's story. This is North America's story yeah. in the world story. And from my perspective, uh, my time at the convoy. So, you know, I, I went across the United States from California all the yes. way across uh in the convoy, and there were so many Canadian flags yeah. because of the leadership from Canada. Mm -hmm. It was actually bizarre to see so many Canadian flags in the convoy and on the sides of the road showing gratitude for the idea that came from Canada and the leadership. Yeah, and I, yeah. And I think um, when I first heard of you... A lot of us were saying, hey, we're the, supposed to be the leaders, and, uh, and our Canadian brothers and sisters are the ones doing it. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. yeah. And, and when I first heard about, about you, you were on uh, Jordan Peterson's podcast. Yeah. And you were talking about the Dutch farmers because you had gone over and spent time with the Dutch farmers. Yeah. Which was important to me because I obviously participated in the Canadian convoy. Um, and I, you know, some of the things that I learned about right. the Dutch farmers. Um, I had been told that we, you know, our convoy in Canada had inspired 27 other countries around the world to hold their own, including the, the Dutch, including the People's Convoy across America towards um, Washington, D.C. Right. Masako and I were out with the Dutch, and they right. were getting direct inspiration from the Canadians. Right. I'm sorry, I actually forgot about that. Mm -hmm. We do so much, and we go to so many places and see so much. Yeah. But we were out with them, and their tractors, and... And, uh, and they were, and you can see they had Canadian flags up as well. Yeah. In Netherlands. And Chris Barber, who's a, uh, Harold Jonker, who are, were big, big significant pieces of the Canadian convoy, were just recently over in the Netherlands 
um, with another guy, a really courageous Canadian named Chris Scott. Who, Chris Scott. He's the owner of the Whistle Stop Cafe in uh, Alberta. Mm -hmm. uh, he was one of my heroes as a Canadian prior to the convoy. I actually got to meet Chris during the convoy. And, uh, you know, so the three of them had, have recently traveled to the Netherlands and, you know, they were into France and a couple other locations. Oh, so you went to, I, I should meet they this did. fellow if, I, if you can introduce me. Yes, I'd like to. Yeah. Uh, Harold Jonker, he's from Niagara. We spoke mm -hmm. about him yesterday when we drove by that big truck stop in the Niagara region. Uh, he was the truck captain from the Niagara region that right. kind of corralled a lot of people, him and a lot of his supporters. And mm. a lot, like people basically from the Niagara region were at that truck stop we drove by yesterday. Right. So you had, you know, I had first heard of you on Jordan Peterson's podcast, and then I had started to follow you after. Recently, you were on the Sean Ryan show. And this is funny for me because I was watching the Sean Ryan interview and as I was interviewing it, you kept, you know, getting me interested in these, these thoughts. And I started DMing you on Twitter and, uh, lo and behold, that night you answered me on Twitter and within a couple of days, you were actually in my living room where we had just met, you know, we've gone. I don't play the... around. No, you don't play <laughs> around, right? It was, this is, this Half is Half parachute will jump. Yeah. And, and what was really interesting is. Since I first learned about you, you have completely dominated the, all of the, the people in the whole subject around the Darien Gap in Panama. And I don't mean dominate in a bad way, but you have literally become the North American subject matter expert in the Darien Gap in Panama. And you have taken some incredibly well-known Americans, uh, Canadians and, and other people to the Darien Gap to educate really the Western, um, you know, important people that should know about the Darien Gap. Like you've taken Brett Weinstein, you've taken, uh, uh, Chris Martinson, who I had done his crash course years ago when I was doing my MBA. And I got a chance, thanks to you to speak to Chris today on the phone, which is, it's a big deal for me. Um, you have yeah, taken actually we were, we were talking with him about the bridge issue and other issues. Yeah, right, right. And uh, yeah. so we'll get into that, but we're, you know, you've taken uh, Laura Loomer um, mm -hmm. there as well. You've taken congressmen there as well. So you are really the North American subject matter expert on the Darien Gap. And we're going to talk a lot about what that means for North America and, and maybe parts of Europe or maybe the world. Um, but before we get into that, what's really, really important, because you and I spent a lot of time talking about vocabulary, what really matters. We talked about the Overton window. We talked about the context of certain words that people use. Um, and so I think before we get into this discussion, I really want to, and you and I are both fans of the phrase set the conditions. Um, this is really, really important. It is a military sort of term that we use. But it's really important. So if we're going to set the conditions for this conversation, I think it's vitally important that we have the right vocabulary and we're setting the right context for the viewers who want to learn about all of these illegal immigrants coming into the United States and Canada. We will talk about uh, our trip yesterday to the Niagara region. But what I'd like to do, because this is, this is really a great opportunity because this, I think this is a bee in your bonnet for, for a lot of, uh, discussion about illegal Im immigrants coming into North America. So I want to give you this opportunity to really set the, set the conditions for what's really happening. You've objected many times to, uh, migrants, immigrants. So these terms are not the proper terms. They don't convey the right context around a conversation. So I want to give you the opportunity to really set that stage. It's important. Word, word choice is massively important. The highest form of warfare is information warfare. As a combat engineer, you know about setting battlefield conditions, mm -hmm. physical conditions, and psychological warfare experts set mental conditions. The reasons we have no actual borders anymore are because condition, the psychological warfare. 
right? Mm -hmm. It's the reason why boys are confused about being girls and girls boys. We got, we're driving down the road yesterday and we smelled dope while we're driving down the road. Mm -hmm. None of us smoke dope. We're going way too fast to smell anybody around us and our windows are up anyway. Mm -hmm. Turns out there's these big greenhouses filled with massive amounts of dope, blowing those blowers out, setting conditions, getting people smoking dope, dumbing them down. I know a lot of the marijuana smokers out there, it's about freedom or whatever. Yeah, you're all doped up talking about that, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, let's talk about this reality. We're in a state of war, right? Yes. We have to speak the truth or we're going to literally lose and probably die, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and, and words are atomic structures of truth and untruth, right? So if you choose the wrong word, let's go back to Iraq. I spent two years in the Iraq war and two years in the Afghan war. So four years between those two wars and then a lot of other wars and conflicts. Mm -hmm. And what I can say is the people that, that identify something the earliest accurately and say it and act on it mm -hmm. are much more likely to set the conditions for being successful, right? So right. when you see people talking about migration crisis, mm -hmm. it, like New York Post today talked about migrants attacking, was it 61 migrants just charged, they said, mm -hmm. with attacking our border patrol down in, or National Guard or whatever down in Texas, okay. right? First of all, what kind of migrants attack people? And we saw the videos. Mm -hmm. we, this is an invasion. They physically overran the barriers and physically attacked some of our people on the border. That's a clear invasion. Who invades? Invaders, right? I mean, the, the idea that this is a migrant, and we have so many conservatives that are so afraid to say, anything other than migrant or migration. Well, you're wrong from the beginning. All else that follows will be wrong. I don't care if you write an entire book or an encyclopedia. If you can't even get the right word right from the beginning, all that follows is suspect or wrong. If you're creating water, what do we need? We need hydrogen and oxygen in the proper ratio and the proper geometry, right? Mm -hmm. Two hydrogens, one oxygen. If you're going to make a truthful statement about migration crisis, that's like li taking lithium and oxygen and saying this is, lithium and oxygen will not make water. Mm -hmm. You know, hydrogen and lithium won't make water. It has to be the right amount at the right time in the right, context is vital. We're clearly being invaded. Now, we have to look at this in broader context. For instance, the death jabs, mm -hmm. people calling these experimental vaccines. Mm -hmm. First of all, we know this, these are not vaccines, right, right. period. Full stop, right? Mm -hmm. Anybody still calling them vaccines? I don't know what to say. Where do they even get the term experimental? I bring this up with virologists, immunologists, uh, uh, many uh, vaccinologists. And when I say, where's your evidence that this is experimental? None of them mm -hmm. can actually provide it. Well, everybody knows it's experimental. I'm like, okay, don't even go there with everybody knows anything, right? right. You know, right. Everybody who took the jab obviously didn't realize that they just got hit, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, with a, with a, this, this was used as a weapon. What's a weapon? A weapon is anything that's used as a weapon, right? right? Water obviously can be used as a weapon and frequently is, right? I mean, everything that's used as a weapon is a weapon. This was used as a weapon. The death jabs. Let's just call them what they are. Death jabs. That's part of a broader hybrid war. We're in a hybrid war. We're being hit with weaponized migration. We're being hit with death jabs. We're being hit with uh, information war. That, that, that's what set, sets conditions for all of this. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're being replaced. This is a replacement population that's coming in. Now, our enemies say this clearly. They don't even hide it. Right. They don't even hide it. We can hear what they say and then repeat it, and they'll say, well, that's a conspiracy theory. But that's part of their information. They're like winking at us. Those of us who know the game that they're playing, they're like, well, that's a conspiracy theory. Mm -hmm. And then they wink. You know, yeah. you know, because oh, yeah. they know so many people will just pick up on that. But the bottom line is they're, we're going into the most intense famines that have ever been unleashed on humankind, right? right. Bigger than the 1816 year without a summer and all these things, right? Uh, you know, famine is something I've studied around the world, read many books on it, gone to places, to Ireland, Japan, mm -hmm. looking into these things, because clearly we can see that our enemies are setting conditions for famine. Why is famine important? That will drive hop, human osmotic pressure. Human osmotic pressure is the push and the pull of migration. 
that now you see down the Darien Gap or here in Canada where there's no border and the biggest border in the world between the United States and Canada. Uh, once that hop is set with the, the human osmotic pressure from famines or war or pandemic, you will be overrun. Mm -hmm. That's why we're down in the Darien Gap so much because as soon as Biden was installed, Masako Ganaha and Chuck Holton and I, we, we flew straight from Washington, went over to El Paso, Texas, and immediately they were coming across the border. We were down there within 24, 48 hours. Then we flew to Colombia, South America, and watched, went to that side of the Darien Gap, just to the edge, and they were starting to flood through there. Then we went to the Panama side. Now, at this time, we've spent many, I've, I've probably spent six months in the Darien since Biden was installed. Mm -hmm. Why? Because recognizing that this is a main invasion route and as they set conditions for famine that will create the human osmotic pressure to be able to just flow right through if you can get your feet in south america mm -hmm. you can get anywhere you can get right here within 10 days okay. easily if you can get the if you can get to ecuador you can get to colombia in one day on a bus you take a boat you can literally be here in 10 days we know of a chinese guy for instance landed in quito ecuador he ended up uh, in uh, New York and had a driver's license in about 10 days, wow. a driver's license, mm -hmm. because you got to keep in mind the Chinese are, they're not coming in like planet of the apes. They have their own structure within a structure, right? right. They have a pipeline within a, they have numerous pipelines within a larger pipeline. And the larger pipeline is facilitated by the United Nations, which was found, which was, you know, built by the United States mostly and with our money and our guidance and our, mm -hmm. and now we're literally causing our own invasion. Now I see Americans leaving comments today saying we should declare, you know, Canada and Mexico as enemies. I'm like, are you out of your mind? The ones who, the, yeah. literally, that's falling right into your enemy's uh, playbook. It's the United States that's causing the invasion of the United States. It's Canada causing yes. the, invited, the invasion of Canada, right? Mm -hmm. You've had Chinese troops training here, right? Yes. As you, yeah. are, you know personally. It, go ahead, sir. Yeah, no, I, um, I do. Like I, there's a photo that's circulating on social media. It's a combat engineer officer, great guy. I did all my training as a young officer with him. I was posted to my regiment with him. He later on went to become the commanding officer of the regiment. And he literally is the guy that's in the photo shaking hands with the Chinese army officer. And I knew his sergeant major as well. And I remember when that photo came out because I, you know, I emailed him. I won't say his name, but I emailed him and I said, hey, I, I think your career just got destroyed by accident or on purpose. And jokingly, I said this to him, his career's fine. But he said, you know, he's been getting calls all week long. He even got his calls from his father, who was a retired colonel, saying, you know, what's going on? And then, you know, you scratch the surface on this and you realize that in Canada, the Chinese military has been training in here, here for a number of years. And not only that, but they've trained in Petawawa, which is where I served, Gagetown, which is also where I served. You know, we're, the, the general public is shocked to find out that we're doing uh, these training exercises. Like, for example, you would expect that Americans and Brits and NATO countries would train together. We have a NATO standard in the way we operate so that we can be interoperable. But we do this because we have an adversary, right? We're, we're, Which is we're, the people you're now training. We're, this is the people we're right. now training here in Canada. So, I, you know, we're going to come back to that because you said something really, really fascinating at breakfast that I do want to circle back to. But I, I want to talk about a, a little bit the the actual, let, let's use the right term, the invaders themselves. Okay. Oh, can I say one thing? Because sure. you're saying something important and we'll forget about it, I yeah. think. Because the invaders, obviously, what this is all about. Um, it's a huge part of what it's about. Mm -hmm. you, the Canadian forces were training the Chinese in winter warfare. Yes. Uh, to a lot of people, that doesn't mean anything. To me, having been in 10th Special Forces Group mm -hmm. and having done intensive winter warfare uh, training, mm -hmm. I recognize how important that is. Yes. I mean, training people in that art and form of war, I mean, that is a big, big deal. It's mm -hmm. not just everybody that can fight in extreme cold weather. It takes training, it takes practice, mm -hmm. it's an art form, and it's a knowledge that comes down through generations. Yes. And so the knowledge that you have and that I have from 10th Special Forces Group, are you being in the Canadian Army, mm -hmm. uh, which like the Norwegians and whatnot, and the Russians, you specialize in this stuff. Yes. And 
training them in winter warfare is a big deal. Mm. They can go because you know winter will kill more soldiers than than bullets ever will, right? Yes. And training them how to overcome the winter, specifically this winter, and how to I mean, that's a big deal. That's literally mm. training them to invade Canada. Yeah. I when I was coming up in the military, I heard uh, a couple of stories where you had a, because we send, Canadians send uh, people on the Q course, on the special forces course that you did. And by the way, as a 19 year old man, you had done and graduated from the, your Green Beret or special forces course or the Q course. We've sent Canadians on that course as well. But we typically yeah. send. One of my team leaders through the Q course was Canadian. Right. Right. And, and one of the things that uh, we typically on almost every serial, I don't know if they're doing it still, but they always sent. A Canadian on every Ranger course uh, on the serial, and I know several guys that have gone through and done the the Ranger course. But I remember hearing a story uh, about a Canadian who was in a four man detachment on his Ranger course. They got hit with some really horrendously cold weather. Two of the people in the debt, uh, which were American soldiers, not accustomed to dealing with with cold weather, uh, did actually die of hypothermia, and he carried out the third American soldier, uh, got him to safety. And was that in Ranger training? Sir? It was in the Ranger course. Was that in yeah. Florida? Uh, I don't know where the course was, uh, or where that that where specifically in the United States. So I, but I can tell you, I can tell you from experience, the two coldest places I've ever been was Petawawa in July, in Florida in March. The two coldest times I've ever had experienced in a my life. A lot of people don't understand that about cold weather. Mm -hmm. and, and those who don't understand that little bit about cold weather have no idea how to operate right. it. They have no idea that 50 degree weather Fahrenheit, which is what in... in, in uh, uh, that's, well, 30, I think 30 Fahrenheit is around zero Celsius for us. Uh, 32 would be, uh, 32.1 or 2, mm -hmm. I think, is, uh, is uh, zero. Right. Right, right. And so that's our freezing point, mm -hmm. right? For pure water. Anyway, but the bottom line is, is, uh, uh, you know, like 40 degree, 50 degree mm -hmm. for us. That's what kills a lot of people. Yes. And a lot of people don't get that. They think it's the minus 40 or whatever, which obviously will kill you quickly. Mm -hmm. Uh, but it's really that, that above the freezing point, right? Yeah. Uh, you're, you're wet and you're tired and people and it ambushes them because they have no idea how to operate in the cold weather. Yeah. And, and a big risk to people, which seems like a, you'd be surprised by the detail, but it's actually your own sweat that's oh, going to yeah. make you suffer the most yeah. if you don't manage your own perspiration. But, which is one of the ways one of the ways you can kill your enemies in cold weather is just to make them work. You might not be able to hit them, but make them work. Make them make them move around. Make them run yeah. around. Get hot and let the let the, let yeah. the weather take care of them. You know, there's multiple reasons why Canada agreed to train the Chinese military. But I, what I do remember was when it, was, it became publicly known that China was training on Canadian soil with Canadian Army, there was a backlash. And I remember the Chief of Defense Staff put, a, put an end to the next iteration of training. And I remember specifically that the Trudeau government was absolutely furious with, uh, at the time it was General Vance. Um, but, you know, this is, we're, we're going to get into something because, again, at breakfast, you mentioned something that really, again, going back to setting the conditions. This is a key phrase. But we're going to come to that. So don't let me forget about what we talked about on, on how China has everything in place all over the world. So we'll come back to that. But let's go back to the invaders themselves. Okay. What's in it for them? They're making a trek from, uh, you know, China. Southeast Asia, South America, Africa. They're making the trek either to Canada to head into the United States, or they're coming up from the South, from South America, crossing the, uh, the Darien Gap and getting into the United States or into Canada from there. But ultimately, what is in it for them? Because we talked at breakfast today about them. You know, are they willful idiots or are they coming here on a mission? Do they believe that once they get to their destination, they're chasing the American dream? Or are they actually on a mission? But ultimately, what is in it for these people making this journey? All the above. Some are just like Haitians that we see in huge numbers. Uh, they're, they're not coming to try to rule the world. Uh, they don't have those kind of aspirations or capabilities in any m means whatsoever, right? Yeah. 
Uh, but there are others, such as Chinese Communist Party. They're crystal clear that they want to take over the world, right? There's all, through space and time, there's been a lot of groups and peoples who've wanted to rule the world, say the Catholic Church, right? Uh, or um, Islam in various forms. And there's many, many, many different sorts that want to rule the world, right? Most have no capability to do it, right? However, um, I would say the Chinese actually conditions, they are setting conditions that they could do it, right? Mm -hmm. Through many different methods. One is the, abil the ability to target people genetically. In other words, and they will do genocide the way other people plant a garden. Like I've been to Tibet and I've seen what they've done to the Tibetans. Mostly it's replacement. So they push the Tibetans out mm -hmm. to northern India and Nepal. I've spent a year in Nepal, a year in India, and a year in and around China. And I've been all over these places. I've mm -hmm. spent about 18 years in Asia, right? I've seen Tibetans all over. They're up in northern California and Oregon fl flying their prayer flags. They're not going back, right? Mm -hmm. They're doing this. The Chinese Communist Party is doing the same in Xinjiang. They did the same in Macau. It's mostly replacement. I've been to Macau. Of course, Macau is very small. So it's easy to just kind of move in and supplant. And in Hong Kong, I was there for about seven months during the, the final spasms, 2019 mm -hmm. and 20. And you can see mostly the Chinese Communist Party set conditions by bringing, uh, uh, you know, Mandarin speaking Han Chinese into the Cantonese speaking Hong Konger land mm -hmm. and, and took over positions as professors and policemen, politicians. Uh, teachers, they were rewriting textbooks, rewriting history, and, and they set conditions. And so when it came to those final, you know, death throws, they had already seized the cockpit, right? Mm -hmm. They already had control of the upper echelons of most of the leadership. Not all, but they had the critical mass, right? It's not mm -hmm. about taking everything over. It's about playing the game of go, not playing the game of chess. Mm -hmm. They're coming to become you, right? They're, right. Com they're not coming to... You know, a Sun Tzu, what do they say? You know, the acme of war is to, is to win without fighting, mm -hmm. right? And, and that's what, they're very good. They don't want to destroy everything. Mm -hmm. They want to take it. They want to just move you out or destroy, you know, do a soft genocide if possible. A hard genocide is Nazis, death camps, mm -hmm. that sort of thing. A soft genocide is rewriting history, making everybody speak different languages, uh, pushing people out, but you can also poison them with cholera, poison them with typhus, poison them with everything, death jabs. I mean, think about that one. Mm -hmm. I mean, look at the royal family now in the UK. This is an oligarch versus oligarch fight. It's not just it's not just this group. It's, you know, even within the Chinese Communist Party, they have different oligarchical mm -hmm. structures, right? But look at the look at the British royal family. Three of them have cancer now. Right. Now now, a lot of people would say, well, the British royal family would be smart enough. They wouldn't take the real thing. What do you base that on? You know, as somebody who studied cults religiously, let's say, you know, <laughs> I actually infiltrated and lived with a cult at one point. Right. I went to India studying these things. I went and I infiltrated one in California many years ago. I studied cults quite a lot. And it, because I got on that trail when I was in special forces, when the old timers, which would be like 40, you know, yeah. they were they were like, you know, you need to study world religions, study cults. I'm like, study cults? What's this all about here? You know? But, you know, but you find, you know, I was starting to realize how important information were, right? right? And I realized that the only cults that people will never see is the cults that we're in. You see, right. everybody else's cult is quite obvious, right? Mm -hmm. And look at the British royal family, right? Uh, or actually, I know somebody who actually knows Melinda Gates, right? Right. And Melinda Gates, from uh, a friend of mine who knows her, says that she's totally woke. Mm -hmm. I mean, totally bought into it, like right. radically so. Mm -hmm. and, and as is one of her daughters, right? Just radically, you might think that they would be above and beyond it. But one of the things you'll learn about cults is that people can be, it, your, your station in life, economic station or whatever, your royal station or whatever, is completely irrelevant to your station or your, your infectability, whether it's an actual virus or a bacteria or whatever, or thoughts, right? Mm -hmm. Like, you know, when I was in India, it was quite, India is, a, is an amazing place to travel. I've been to what, 98 countries now. I've spent most of my life out of the United States, mm -hmm. right? So in, I grew up in Florida, but I've spent most of my life in the other 98 or so countries that I've been to. And I divide the world into two countries, India and all the rest of them I've seen, right? <laughs> It's a high energy environment. Like when you go to war, you see things happen very fast and high energy. So they, they pop out like in the, in the last, since the, the, the pandemic, 
we've seen things at high energy. We've seen the information more, the amplitude is very high. So signal to noise, it's easier to see the, the signal now. Likewise, when I was in India, watching uh, cult formations, mm -hmm. which can happen at an accelerated rate there. I'm watching people come and try to manipulate me at all times, right? Mm -hmm. Like, oh, what is your good name? Where are you from? And they're checking out where you stay, what you're wearing. And, you know, they're, they're sussing you up for, uh, for whatever, right? Yeah. Sounds like you're getting off a plane in Mexico and you're about to walk out of the terminal and you get hammered by everyone who wants to Much sell. more sophisticated. Sell, sell you Much more share. sophisticated. <laughs> Much more sophisticated. Yeah. I mean, the, the, in, in India, it can, there's the low level uh, mm -hmm. trickery. And then there's the higher level, much higher sophistication level, right? Which yeah. can actually start back here in Canada or San Francisco mm -hmm. or someplace where, you're, where the travel agent is actually sending you to his family members and then you end up in Kashmir mm -hmm. and da 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 da. Anyway, yeah. but the bottom line is what I've found is, is the people that are very sophisticated at this, which is not just Indians, of course, there's a yeah. lot of people that are and Americans of, of many sorts. And we're all born into very sophisticated and very smooth and honed information wars mm -hmm. and it's a jungle so there's many information wars going some overlap and, and some compete and some uh it's, it's, it's a jungle out there it's a multiplayer game mm -hmm. but look what i'm getting to is the british royal family now did they actually take the jabs and is there cancer that seems to be taking mm -hmm. hold or a, a, a product of that i do not know it's right. just another suspicious thing the, the uh, crown princess in Thailand, she mm -hmm. took four jabs, two AstraZeneca and two Moderna, right? Mm -hmm. And she's now never going to be, she, she's out of the game, right? right, right. And, and so, uh, and, 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 you know, I love Thailand and the Thai people, they're very dear to my heart. Mm -hmm. And so I, 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 I'm concerned about Thailand, right? right? Because I know that people are trying to knock out their royal family through every method possible, not because the royal family is the one guard against everybody coming to Thailand, but it's how the Thais will rally around the royal family, mm -hmm. right? And the British as well. That's the little rock, but you know, that they can hold on to. However, at this point, the British royal family has been helping with the invasion of the U as the Dutch royal family. The, the Dutch royal family is useless, right? Mm -hmm. In fact, they're the enemy of the Netherlands, right? Right. And they don't even want people to call it Dutch anymore. They don't want to. Call, they don't. Want, they don't even want to hear the word Holland anymore, right? Right. Because that's part of the information war to get the farmers off of their fields, right? Mm -hmm. Not just to take control of the food supply. That's one thing, mm -hmm. but also farmers and fishermen. They tend to. They're like a core around your culture, right? Mm -hmm. They keep your culture alive. Right. So they're attacking the Dutch farmers. I spend significant time over there for these. Anyway. Back to the oligarch versus oligarch. Mm -hmm. Kings still kill kings. Right. I suspect, I do not know, that the British royal family was just targeted and probably taken out. Right. Right. They're not going to last. One way or the other, they're not going to last. Done. Right. Yeah. They're done for every reason. They have, the United Kingdom has been invaded. Masako Ganaha and I went to Ireland about, I don't know, a year and a half ago or so. And the place is overrun. Mm -hmm. You know, we went up to, we were in Dublin, then we went up to Belfast and other places. There's over 20 miles of wall between white Irish that are Catholics versus white Irish that are Protestant. Mm -hmm. More than 20 miles. It makes the Trump wall look like a fence, and the Trump wall is a serious wall. Mm -hmm. We've been up and down that wall. But you look at the one in, in Belfast, Ireland, to separate Irish from Irish, but Catholics versus Protestants, just think about that. Even the Irish can't get along. Mm -hmm. And now you're filled with Nigerians and Afghans and Somalis and, and, and mm -hmm. Pakistanis and whatnot, right? Well, it's the same here in, 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 in uh, I'm sorry, go ahead, Yeah, sir. no, because I've seen the video footage of, you know, the Muslim call to prayer on the London Bridge. Like, who, if you look at the leadership of all of the countries in that area, who are, who are they comprised of? Who's the Prime Minister of, Canada, or of, of Britain right now? What about Ireland? Like, if you're you're not seeing, um, I can't remember the name of the the British Prime Minister right now off the top of my head. I should know this. Um, he's Indian, of Indian descent. Um, I think Ireland as well. Like, they are overrun. Like a lot of the countries. Look at the leadership here in in Canada. It's not they've crossed the Rubicon. They have. Yeah. They have they have lost the critical mass. They've mm -hmm. lost the initiative. Yeah. It's Camp of the Saints. 
Let, let me now, ask. By the way, Camp of the Saints is the book that, when you mention that, mm -hmm. the, 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 the suckers that are in the cult will say, oh, he mentioned Camp of the Saints. He's there for da 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 right? Right. It's a, but the, literally, the Camp of the Saints unraveled this idea back in the 70s of like ships coming ashore just loaded with people. Yeah. It's just a matter of time. Effectively, that's already happening. It's right. not physical ships, but it's, it's a, well, actually it has been in some cases, mm -hmm. but, it, but it's mostly coming in airplanes 24-7. It's coming across our borders, the Canadian border, both mm -hmm. directions, from Bahamas, from everywhere, right? Right. So you, when you and I first got into contact, um, you, you were coming to Toronto. And I guess the question really is, because you've been all over the world, uh, several times over, but what is it specifically right now about Canada that interests you? And the reason I ask is because, you know, I've reached out to, to many different Americans and I'm always happy when, um, it, my expectation is that America is not going to save us. That is off the table right now. America is not going to save us, nor the Brits or the French or anything. But at the end of the day, I'm just very relieved and very happy to hear that people are starting to pay attention to America's northern border. And I, I believe, keep an eye on the southern border, but you've got two borders uh, of great importance. And from a national security point of view in the United States, it's incumbent upon America to keep an eye on the border. And I know that sounds strange coming from a Canadian, because I'm saying, hey, my country, you need to be aware of the threats of my country against yours. And maybe in a small way, that is a, is a cry for help. Um, but I think it's important for Americans to start paying attention to what's going on here. We're more than just igloos and having our bank accounts frozen, um, you know, in Tim Hortons versus a protest we've done. Like there's a lot of activity going on, but the, you know, yes, you've got invaders coming into Canada, but I would say that the Trudeau government, I, I'm just going to say like the Uniparty, like all three, I, I, there's 338 members of parliament. There is one or two that I actually like quite a bit. So I'm going to go out and, on a limb and say the 336 uh, members of parliament that I think are a huge risk to not only Canada, but of North America itself. And... You know, I, I guess what I'm, that's a long, long question, but at the end of the day, what is it about all the other countries you've been to? Why are you looking at Canada now? Um, and what interests you about Canada? I've been looking at it since the beginning. I just haven't been coming up here mm -hmm. because there's only so much I can do. Yes. So, uh, I mean, this is a high priority, obviously. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's the biggest border in the world, right? And it's basically almost completely unguarded. Uh, we went to a train trestle yesterday mm -hmm. uh, that is used as a as a, a capillary back and forth. Uh, we went to that one just because it's nearby. Mm -hmm. In reality, I go, I've seen so many of these capillaries, I can't even imagine to remember. Right? That, that was a big shock for me because I had driven through that area many times. And I, you know, I, I, as a young guy growing up in Niagara Falls, Ontario, you know, we used to cross the border. We would go shopping. You could walk. You pay a dime, go through the turnstile, no, no passport, nothing. But you had to cross over the Rainbow Bridge in Niagara Falls, where I'm from. Or you can go to the Lower Bridge, or you can go as far as Buffalo to the Peace Bridge. But you could literally walk from Canada to the United States, show your ID, and they'd wave you through. Now you've got to go through dogs. You've got to show your passport. It's much more difficult. But yesterday, what I saw, I have to say, was pretty shocking to me how easy you could literally traverse from Canada to the U.S. or U.S. back to Canada. And we, so yesterday when we went uh, and we looked at that, that basically it's a rail line um, that goes from Canada to the U.S., U.S. to Canada, I was shocked how easy it was to actually make that journey across the international border. I mean, there, there's nobody there checking you for IDs. You're not paying your dime to cross like I did as a teenager. But, you know, we did learn something um, from, from local residents around there that were hesitant but willing to kind of give their impressions of it. But, you know, that, that was a big eye-opener for me. And what's really interesting about it is 
it was such a benign crossing, hidden in plain sight, very easy to do it. But you have seen this many in many different places around North America as well. So this isn't this wasn't a surprise to you like it was for me. Countless. Yeah. Europe as well and other places, Asia. I mean, I see it everywhere, right? Mm -hmm. I see these capillaries everywhere. It's countless, right? Right. Now, one thing that's very important is you mentioned being surprised and shocked. And and that's very important to to halt for a minute and talk about that. Mm -hmm. When when we're developing paradigms on how to if you want to be predictive about what's happening, uh, you have to make sure that you're looking at the world in a way that doesn't leave you shocked or surprised. Mm -hmm. Because every time you feel that emotion of shock or surprise, which we all do, and again, I don't mean the surprise of waking up in the Darien Gap with a snake on your face. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> that's a different kind. Uh, there, there is the um, uh, uh, the shock of of of, of seeing, uh, like again, people crossing the border like that. Mm -hmm. That that means you didn't understand actually what's happening right right and so so every time you feel that you need to stop and reassess and recalculate like your gps you missed the exit recalculating mm -hmm. paradigm right right and sometimes you need to throw the whole thing out sometimes mm -hmm. just tweak it uh and so your paradigm should always leave you not shocked not surprised and it should leave you with the ability increasingly to be able to predict things. Mm -hmm. You'll always get some things wrong, but your, predicti your predictive abilities should increase. Mm -hmm. uh, for instance, now a lot of people are shocked and surprised that, that they're being told that they need to take people into their homes, right? And why would they be shocked or surprised? We've been publishing this. And this is old communist tech. This mm -hmm. is old stuff. This was so amazingly coming. That's like being that's like moving to Florida and being shocked that hey there's these things called hurricanes, mm -hmm. right? I right. mean that's just part of being in Florida. And part of what's happening now with this form of warfare is people will be pushed right now it's it's you know hey you need to take them in we'll pay you money to take them in and they're shocked at that and surprised. Wait till they see come what comes next. What comes next is they will be killed. Mm -hmm. They will be killed. I want to say it crystal clear they will be killed and their homes will be taken, right? They'll be run out. The ones who aren't, this is a, this is a war. We're in a war. Mm -hmm. This is not a, a border crisis. What we're seeing at that railway yesterday mm -hmm. and what I see all over, the, all over the place, whether it's Morocco, Morocco sending, pushing people to Ceuta and Melilla, it's two Spanish mm -hmm. cities that are actually in Africa, or you know, uh, Belarus pushing people to Lithuania. I spent five weeks watching that or you know, uh, people being pushed into in Japan and these sorts of things. These are actual war moves. Mm -hmm. These are all about reaching a certain critical mass. And once they get to enough people there, they're gonna go for it. They're gonna go for it. But first, it's a soft genocide. It's just slowly moving mm -hmm. in. Now, it's setting conditions. Keep in mind, there's multiple oligarchical structures that are big enough to do something. The Chinese, right, of course. There's various Western ones that would fall under the umbrella of the World Economic Forum, right? Mm -hmm. and, and, and they will both overlap and, and reinforce each other and cooperate at times. Like the Chinese Communist Party cooperates very closely with the World Economic Forum, but clearly they're going to fight at some point, mm -hmm. right? Uh, but they both have an interest in destabilizing the United States, Canada, Mexico, and all the rest, right? Mm -hmm. and, and then taking the, I keep telling my Mexican friends, you know, they want Mexico. They don't want Mexicans, right? Right. And, 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 and blacks in America, I tell them all the time on interviews and face to face, they're, out, they're doing the race hatred to get you to kill me. And then when it's done, guess what? The Chinese, you have, you've never seen racism mm -hmm. until you see the Chinese Communist Party. They're highly racist against other Chinese that speak different dialects, like mm -hmm. Fujianese or Cantonese, right? Right. And, and the bottom line is they have zero use for anybody black on planet Earth. Mm -hmm. And they will target you. And you won't be fighting with AR-15s. Right. They'll cut off your food. Mm -hmm. They'll cut off your electricity. You'll freeze to death. They'll, they'll poison your water with mm -hmm. cholera, right? Right. And they'll, they'll put death jabs in your arms, mm -hmm. right? Uh, they'll do all sorts of things to reduce your population to a certain point where you just don't have the critical mass to resist. And then it's game one, like what happened to, with the Tibetans, right? right? What happened with the Hong Kongers, which is tiny to begin with, or the Muslims in Xinjiang, right? Mm -hmm. This is a normal way that they operate. And not just them, but anyway, the bottom line is, 
what's happening is a replacement population. Mm -hmm. They're moving in. Now, you keep in mind what the Chinese, they've literally somehow persuaded your government to go to training with them. They do the same in Thailand, right? To literally teach them winter warfare while they're learning everything, while they're sussing out all your command structure. They're recruiting spies. They're not just here to get winter warfare training. They're here to figure out who can we recruit here. Mm -hmm. They're doing the mice thing, right? Money, ideology, coercion, ego. When they're, they're, they're going to be sending counter intelligence experts to do that training and they're going to be identifying soldiers in your army to to recruit right mm -hmm. uh and and they're and they're going to be doing it hardcore that's how they play now all these huge amounts that are moving here some portion of those will be setting up the structures for later very serious actions in other words they fight in a different way than the u.s fights mm -hmm. the u.s now has this idea of expeditionary fighting where our logistics is so important, which it is, because we bring over all of our food and all of our ammunition with us. That's not how they roll. Right. The old form of warfare is you fight on the hoof, right? Mm -hmm. You show up like Genghis Khan and you find the, you find the food there. If you can't, you eat their horses. You eat their, you eat your horses. Mm -hmm. you, that's where filet mignon came from. Yeah. You know, filet mignon, putting it mm -hmm. under the, the leather saddles and eating, you know, the salt from the horse. Any, but the bottom, or eating the people. I mean, cannibal. Mm -hmm. I'm dead serious about that. I'm absolutely dead serious about that. A lot of people are, are shocked about that. They're like, that stuff would never happen. I'm like, mm -hmm. I'm sorry. You're way behind on actually how things really work in this world. Mm -hmm. They will come in and they will, first of all, take everything. Mm -hmm. And they will have preposition. They will take, you see these guys growing the dope. Mm -hmm. uh, in, the, the, in Canada or in, uh, in the United States, we got huge amounts of Chinese coming in, growing billions of dollars worth of dope. They can easily, they're making huge amounts. They're dumbing our populations down, mm -hmm. uh, you know, to the, like Joe Rogan levels of stupidity at this point. Uh, the borders are wide open. Whoosh, whoosh. It's like a joke. Yeah. Joe Rogan's language is whoosh and woo. Why, yeah. why would they do that? Let's smoke the bong. They're, he's dumbed down, right? Mm -hmm. and, and, and now they, they're literally, it's the perfect evil. I wrote a couple of dispatches in Afghanistan about that in 2006. Mm -hmm. Growing the opium, selling it to our young people, making billions of dollars to fight us with it and 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 the actual opium creates its own market right mm -hmm. it actually it creates you don't even have to advertise them but you have joe rogan do it but the bottom line is when you have these chinese farmers taking over huge amounts of farmland and bill gates as well world you know you know these guys working together mm -hmm. they will be able to quickly control the food supply right and feed their own troops while starving us to death right mm -hmm. It, well, it's, sorry, it's an sir. interesting thing because I, I do want to circle back to, again, this idea of setting the conditions. Because this is what we talked about at breakfast this morning. And, you know, there's this famous quote from uh, Napoleon. I used to have it on my, my um, bottom of my emails when I was in the military. And, you know, it's something along the lines of um, amateurs talk about uh, tactics, uh, professionals talk about logistics. And, you know, the, the point being, but the interesting thing is, and, and my boss told me to take it down because he pointed out that, um, you know, Napoleon actually went into Russia <laughs> and destroyed his own supply train. Uh, in you know what defeated. killed a lot of the supply train too was typhus. Right. So, so the issue being with, with China, uh, and this is going to lead into my next question about India because I do want to talk about India, but with China... And in, in you, you rightly point out with the Americans, they have expeditionary forces. Like the Marines are a MU, a Marine Expeditionary Unit. They go forward in a carrier battle group. They land on foreign soil. They set up the supply trains. You know, they're fully integrated with air assets, uh, it, you know, Marine infantry, uh, close air support. It's all there. It's all integr integral, but they have to set up the supply train to feed those troops, to get ammo, to do all these other things. But what we talked about at breakfast is you, you pointed out this idea that, again, China is setting the conditions. They are extremely sophisticated. So they've come into North America for decades. And it's like if, if China were, let's say, to be invited, and that's a subject of a, a, a fiction book that, you know, I have talked about that I'm writing, China lands on Canadian soil. Most of their supply train is already in place. They've been setting this up yeah. for decades. They don't need 100 ships a day landing. Exactly. And they will be getting jobs at all your power plants now. Yes. All the, 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 the locks and the, and the canals mm -hmm. and all the critical infrastructure, they will know how to operate it. Yes. Right? Yes. They will know how to... So in other words, they'll just take it. Yes. 
They won't. They don't want to destroy it. They want to take it. Right now, right. the information war. They're setting it up like they built most of the United States and Canada. Mm -hmm. You should see their. I've written three books on Chinese information right. war. They're only in Japanese because I've been working to wake up Japanese for so long. Mm -hmm. But the bottom line is. They are setting conditions in their own people's minds that this is theirs to take. Right. So it's right. justified in their minds. Right. So the other day we were talking at dinner and I asked you about India in your response to me, because, you know, everything we describe about China coming here, like I live in a, a city in the GTA that is at least 50% uh, GTA Indian. for Americans, Greater yeah, Toronto, Greater area. Toronto area. And in, in this particular area is at least 50% Indians. You could walk around this entire neighborhood. Um, everybody is Indian, uh, with the exception of a very few small amount of, you know, what Caucasians. Okay. But what's interesting is you made this comment about India. Cause I asked you, what's the difference really between how India has moved to Canada. Like we're not far from uh, the 55 foot statue uh, that it's a Hindu statue that Hunamant. is created Hunamant, right? It's created some controversy here in Canada, but you know, your comment was, was uh, great because you said the Indians, and we're going to talk about two things here. The Indians are a lot less sophisticated. And you also introduced me to this idea of crabbing. And I want to talk about crabbing because I think it's really important for especially Canadians to understand it because I think Canadians do it viciously to one another. But uh, I, I want to be clear that yeah. when I say the Indians are less sophisticated, yeah. I mean their, their larger structure. Yes. As, but Indians themselves, super educated. And yes. I mean, some of the most brilliant people mm -hmm. you'll ever find. When, when I but talk. They, but they're, they've got a lot of internal uh, structural issues that make it difficult for them to do it. The Chinese have internal structural issues as well that are quite serious, right. uh, but not as many as the Indians have. And right. I take this as someone who spent about two years between those two countries. Right. Like, when I was a teacher, because uh, I, you know, for anyone following, I got fired because I didn't want to participate in the death jab uh, against my will. And uh, so I was fired. I, was, I wasn't fired because I was a bad teacher. I was fired because I wouldn't play the game. And so, you know, all of my, I would say at least 90% plus of all of the students I had were Indian students coming in here on a student visa. They weren't here because they wanted to be software developers. They were here because it was the easiest entry into Canada. They want to come here and whether they're chasing the American dream in Canada or, or not, I don't know. But what I can say is very, very few of them were, had any interest in software. That was pretty apparent to me by the level of, I hate to say, but cheating that constantly went on, uh, in my courses and the other, the other professors that I was with can confirm that as well. So, you know, they're coming in, let's say with their level of, of sophistication, the Chinese are coming in. I, I, I see it. The Chinese come in with a different, a whole new level of sophistication as to the way the Chinese do it. I think the Chinese are more uh, covert in the way they do it while simultaneously being very overt. The Indians are just coming up and saying, we're here now deal with us or don't, uh, but we're here. So, you know, it's a, it's a different, it's a different experience. So as a Canadian, my experience thus far has not been with the Chinese. My experience consistently, the number one, you're on the wrong side of Canada though. Right. If I was in Vancouver, I wouldn't be able to make that claim, but here in Ontario and in the GTA, in fact, we were just out in Saskatchewan and we were in Alberta a week and a half ago. And it was, you know, the constant theme was it's Southeast Asians that are coming here. Uh, it's, it's, definitely a growing population in Saskatchewan and in Alberta. You don't hear about the Chinese going to Western Canada. You hear about them, the Indians, Western Canada and here in Ontario. So, you know, that's important because, you know, we talked about that level of setting the conditions, who's better at setting the conditions. And, and I would, I would argue that it seems to be that China is much more advanced in setting the conditions uh, clearly. all over the world. Although Indians Canada. get very upset when you say that, but a lot of Indians uh, also have, a lot of them are quite honest about it, mm -hmm. actually. So if you, if you want to bring it up, they'll, they'll actually 
you know, they, they're competing with China. And, uh, but I, I found a lot of Indians are incredibly interesting to talk with. They're some of the most interesting people, mm -hmm. actually. Actually, I wish I could go back right now. Right. Uh, because I learn a lot from Indians. But a lot of them are quite honest about it. Mm -hmm. uh, they're like, you know, we got to get this together. I told you the story. I was in Kashmir one time, years ago. I was with this Muslim guy. I stayed with his family for about, I don't know, a week or so, right? Mm -hmm. He's quite wealthy. I stayed on one of, one of his houseboats in Srinagar, right? And he said, you know, God keeps people in three jars. Mm -hmm. and he said, in the first jar, he keeps the Americans. And he keeps that lid very, very tight mm -hmm. because the Americans want to get out and rule the world. Mm -hmm. And I was like, well, that's true. And he goes, in, in the second jar, he keeps the Europeans. And he keeps that lid on but loose the europeans want to rule the world too but they don't try very hard and i was like well that's true <laughs> i lived uh more than six years in europe mm -hmm. and and he said in the third jar he keeps the indians he doesn't even keep the lid on that jar mm -hmm. because every time the indians want to rule the world too but every time one of them, one of them almost gets out the rest pull him back down mm -hmm. i was like no truer words have ever been spoken mm -hmm. that's the crabbing uh right. thing that, that the, the crabbing mentality that many cultures have right mm -hmm. Uh, like Australians have it, Canadians have it, uh, British, I think you got it from the British. Uh, some American cultures have it. Mm -hmm. um, the culture that I'm from doesn't have it. We have the inverse, which is actually quite powerful. Mm -hmm. Like uh, I'll tend to want to raise my friends up right. it, it, higher than me and help me out of the bucket too. The crabbing idea comes from crabs, like my grandfather took us crabbing when you're mm -hmm. a kid. If you have a bucket and you put one crab in there, it can get out. Mm -hmm. But you put, and so you have to put a top on it until you get two or three or four crabs. Mm -hmm. But you get another, you know, you get a few crabs in there and none can get out. You can see videos, for instance, online and you'll see people uh, you'll, uh, you're talking about crabbing and they'll act, some of them have actually done an experiment with crabs and they're like, mm -hmm. hey, it's true. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's where it came from. And like Filipinos crab each other pretty hard. Uh, I get along with Filipinos so great. I see them all over the world. And I'll joke about it with them, like, yeah, you got... And they know the term. Filipinos know the term. They're like, oh, yes, it's one of our weaknesses. But but then they'll do it. In other words, the Filipinos will stick together as a group, mm -hmm. uh, uh, but then they'll crab each other. They'll right. all, and the Australians do it pretty hard. Mm -hmm. uh, Japanese will do it to each other. Mm -hmm. uh, and some cultures don't. And the cultures that don't, like, I would rather lift my friends up and brag and say, hey, that's my friend. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and, and, and we lift each other up. Right. Uh, but um, I think maybe, I think maybe a lot of the Caucasian cultures in the United States got it from different roots. Like mm -hmm. some got it from the British. Yeah. There's a reason uh, we're going to come back to it. It's a bit of a, a change in the subject. Um, but there's a reason I asked you about the crabbing. The Indians crab each other. Yeah. But keep in mind, there's many different Indian cultures. So mm -hmm. that's a huge, all the Indians know that how many languages are on their money? Is it 17? I'm sorry, wow. I've forgotten. But wow. India is highly complex. It's one of the most, it, it's literally, I divide the world into two countries, India and all the rest. I've never seen anything <laughs> about it. I want to go back there. and see. Yeah. One time I was in Hong Kong and I was flying back to India. Mm -hmm. It was just me and a bunch of Indians. And, and I said to one man, I said, you know, I've been around India quite a lot now, and I'm not sure how you don't go into civil war. How do you keep India together? Mm -hmm. Like, I'm like, I'm trying to figure this out. Uh, mm -hmm. and, he's, and one really tall Indian man stood up, and he's like, nobody keeps India together, not even something like not even God or something, but oh, India yeah. keeps India together. And all the Indians laughed. They all got it. No, mm -hmm. I didn't quite get it. But, it, yeah. but, it, yeah. but anyway, somehow they do it. They've got some sophistication that I'm trying to figure out. Like, mm -hmm. They know how to... But they, they will, different Indian cultures will crab each other okay. as well. So that keeps them down, actually. So around 2014, I was having a conversation with a good friend of mine, another uh, military guy. He's a colonel. And um, he had made the observation, because, uh, you know, the Canadian government is always studying geopolitical issues as well as the military, right? It's part of your, if you're, you know, involved in a mission, you've got to go somewhere. First thing you're going to do is try to understand the demographics. But what was really interesting about this conversation, because we were talking about populations. Around 2014, the population of China was roughly below or around 1.4 billion. But the average lifespan or the average age, sorry, of China was about 40 years old. At the same time, India's population was slightly less, but their, av or sorry, their, their average age in India was about 20. 
which meant that they were on the verge now of starting families. So you had India that was kind of, you know, they're all in the 40s, their average age. They're not, you know, producing children. Now you have India who's at 20 and they're about to. So right now, you see a couple years later, their populations are each roughly around 1.4 billion each with an anticipation that India's population is likely to uh, surpass the Chinese population. Difference being... Indians is, always bring that up too. Right. Yeah. The difference being is everybody's spreading out. So it's not a concentration of Indians just in, in their home country. It's in yeah. the home country, but it's the same mentality outside of the They country. have a partial pressure for those that are in the, in the chemistry and physics. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. They spread out. Chinese do that too. Uh, Jews do it. Germans do it. Mm -hmm. uh, British have done it. Uh, you know, there's some cultures that will that will tend to spread. Mm -hmm. Like Germans, for instance, chartering a couple of ships in the old days and moving mm -hmm. to Texas. Right. And they moved the whole village, right? And, uh, you know, and, and uh, Irish have done that. Uh, actually, Irish, a lot of times the Irish have done it based on other things like the famine, right? Mm -hmm. So that's, that was more of a hop from a positive pressure pushing them out. Right. Uh, but, the, um, but, the, um, but some others, like Chinese, you'll see them through space and time. Mm -hmm. They have like a cultural firmware that a lot of the Chinese, for instance, that you'll find in, um, in uh, Panama, as right. an example. Uh, they are, they've been there for 150, 60, 70 years. Right. I mean, cause they were way, they're, they're like, they speak Spanish fluently mm -hmm. and they have, and, and the way that they will, some of the, actually one, one in, in, in Thailand, they, in Thai, Thais call them one mat, one pillow. Right. They show up with one mat, one pillow. And the next thing you know, one generation later, they have a big high rise building or something. Mm -hmm. and, and I was talking with one Chinese guy about that. And I said, how do you do it? Like how? How, 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 why are Chinese so successful? Like, what are some of the secrets? Like, what does your mom and dad teach you and stuff? Mm -hmm. He said, well, you're, first of all, your mother teaches you to write down everything you do with money. If you lose a penny or whatever, or you find a penny, you write it down. If you spend it, if you earn it, you find it was stolen, whatever. Always write it down. Be mindful of your money, right? Mm -hmm. So that it's, you don't just, he said, Americans just spend money too easily, Right. Right. And, and, but Chinese will be very careful. And when your mom tells you to write it down, hey, you got a penny, I want to see it in your book or you know, whatever money yeah, it is yeah. in whatever country they're at. You know what I'm saying? Right. And, and, and so it causes the children to pay attention. So it's little habits like that. Mm -hmm. Like make your bed, write your money down, right? right. And, and, so, and, and other things, like when they move into a place, they'll buy a warehouse, they'll buy a, 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 a business front, whether it's Thailand, whether it's, Oh, oh, so many places. And they'll, they'll live on top of it and below it's the restaurant or whatever, right? Or below it's the store or, right, or whatever. Right. And so then they'll bring over other Chinese who will work for a long time and they'll work hard and then they'll move out and they'll build that community, right? Mm -hmm. So it builds out. So now you've got your, I call it an anthro insula, a human island, right? Mm -hmm. and, 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 and the Indians will do this too, like the ones from Gujarat. Uh, a lot of the Patels, for instance, in the United States, they own so many motels and hotels, right? Mm -hmm. So they'll come over and now they've got their own ecosystems of motels. They're very sophisticated business people mm -hmm. from Gujarat. The Gujaratis, the Patels, right? Patel means like innkeeper in, mm -hmm. in, in Gujarati. Actually, some Gujaratis surely will watch this and right. they can say, and they can, you know, fill in some blanks for me, but yeah, actually yeah. maybe they'll invite me and I can, they can yeah. teach me how they do it right. because, you know, it would be interesting to learn how you do it and then. Mm -hmm. And then explain it, right? Well, yesterday when we were in Niagara Falls and we went to the Flying Saucer, which is an iconic restaurant in Niagara Falls for lunch, as we pulled out, you pointed right beside the Flying Saucer was Patel's Grocer. Uh, like even as a, as a teacher, a lot of my students had the name Patel. It's a cultural firmware. Right. They know how to do it as a group, right? Mm -hmm. And so once they've got a nucleus, whether it's Chinese, Germans, Jewish can do it. You know, they, they can go off and they have these meta structures, right? right? And like we were just down in Belize, we went with the Mennonites. Mm -hmm. We specifically went to Belize in part to talk with Mennonites because right. Mennonites and Amish do that. Mm -hmm. And we wanted to talk about what, why are you moving to Suriname? Mm -hmm. And like some of the Mennonites from Belize are now moving. They speak German. I speak German. I could understand about a third of their German. They mm -hmm. can understand all of mine because I right. speak high German and they speak native Deutsch, which is a low German, right? Mm -hmm. But anyway, bottom line is, is they are, they're moving because the Belizean government and Belize, they wanted them to take the death jab. 
Mm-hmm. And the and the Mennonites are like, nope. And the Mennonites don't cause much trouble, right? It's not like you have a bunch of Mennonites out drunk and tearing the town down, right? Mm-hmm. They do their farming stuff, and they 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 have these huge camps. They call them camps, mm-hmm. and they're just they're very good at farming. Very low, you know, crime is very very low in Mennonites, and and so they they're very they're very productive in Belize. So when the Belize government tried to force them to take the death jobs, they're like. They stuck together. They mm-hmm. have that power of community, right? Right. And then they, they're, so now they're, down, they're making a, a new camp in Suriname, mm-hmm. right? So that's why we wanted to talk with them. Because th- that's one of the things that we don't have. We've lost our power of community, and now it's being taken, like the, 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 uh, the fungus that takes over ant beds, right? Mm-hmm. And a lot of people realize this, uh, different cultures that, and we used to do this, right? We used to do the same. We came in and stuck together. We supplanted the Native Americans of various sorts, and now the Native Americans are gone. Mm-hmm. They couldn't keep it together because all their tribes fought each other, right? right? And they, they, it was easy to make them fight each other. Anthropological warfare, right? Mm-hmm. The Chinese study a lot. Americans study it a lot. We used to study it more, and, and, but now the Chinese... I was watching something about Haifa Harbor recently, you know, in, in Israel, mm-hmm. And, and I was curious about the Chinese relations, and I found this video, and there was a guy, he was an associate professor, I think it was the, uh, he was the number two professor, I think, in Jewish studies at Shanghai University, mm-hmm. and their books are behind him, and the Jewish symbology, and I'm like, you know, he's clearly studying them for, I know why he's studying them, because I, you know, I, I was in special forces, and yeah. one of the first things you learn as a young soldier is anthropological warfare you know mm-hmm. they didn't call it that at the time but right. it's learning how to uh to dance with different cultures and get them to do your work for you yeah. right mm-hmm. and 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 that's what the chinese are doing you know the Areth- aretha franklin song who's zooming who mm-hmm. you know uh, different cultures are zooming cultures that they're in right. Right? right and and the chinese and the and 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 the israeli or let's say the the zionists let's say are trying to zoom each other mm. and you know it's it's very interesting to watch that's what when i'm in india i love to watch the israelis come and haggle with the indians mm-hmm. it's like watch this you know when <laughs> japanese come it's like oh the japanese are americans and we'll yeah. just come and pay the money Mm-hmm. But when it's like uh, when it's Chinese coming or mm-hmm. or Israelis, you're gonna see some world class haggling going on. Right. There's one right. Malaysian uh, comedian mm-hmm. actually uh, did a comedy skit based on Indians and Chinese haggling with each other. Mm-hmm. One of them is trying to keep every penny, and one is trying to take every, every penny. penny. That yeah. guy is absolutely. Yeah. He, I think he's a Chinese Malaysian guy. Right. Well, I can say with uh, you know personal experience, I've seen some Polish people recently do some uh, some haggling, and, and it's impressive. Oh, Polish it's... are good at it. I lived in Poland for two years. Yeah, Polish are hardcore, man. Mm-hmm. Polish are stubborn. Yes. Like you know, oh. they're like a. And I, I don't know why Germany. I lived in Germany for four years. I lived in Poland for two years, and the Germans always think they can push Polish around. I'm like, do you have you ever learned anything about Polish? After living with them and invading them, and you know, for all, the, oh, yeah. it's like the harder you push a Polish, the, mm-hmm. it's a, I call them a non Newtonian culture. Mm-hmm. In physics, non Newtonian means <laughs> that if you hit it hard, it becomes, yeah. if you hit it like ketchup. Yeah. That's why you can't get ketchup out. You got to yeah. be go easy, easy with the ketchup, yes. yeah. it'll come out because yeah. it's non Newtonian. Or yeah. say cornstarch on the pool trick, you know, you have cornstarch and if you if you just step in the cornstarch, you 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 you, might, you can see videos of you know uh, uh, you know you step in the if you fill a pool with cornstarch and water and you step in it, you'll just sink down into it. Right. But if you you can run right across it. Oh, that's neat. because it it firms up. Yes. It, that's why they've talked about making body armor made out of non-Newtonian materials, mm-hmm. so it's flexible. You get hit with a bullet, if it, it it's right. hard just for a moment, and then it's soft again. Mm-hmm. But that's the way the Polish are. I lived there for two years. If you're respectful with Polish people mm-hmm. and you're professional with Polish people, it's everything just smooth. Yeah. But the Germans are always like, bang, bang, the donkey doesn't move. Mm-hmm. It's like, er, er, the don- they're going to kick you again. The Polish people mm-hmm. fight yeah. and they're stubborn. You know, and, and look at the Polish, the EU trying to push all these aliens into Poland. And now they're actually falling for the information more now. But at first they're like, you know, they're not going to take them. Mm-hmm. And again, having lived in Poland for two years, for the welfare of the aliens, for the invaders, 
don't push them into Poland because mm -hmm. that ain't Sweden. In Sweden, you can go rape the women and have a good old time because the Swedish men won't take you out in the street and set you on fire. You do that in Poland and they will descend upon you. Every Polish man in the neighborhood, they'll be ringing the bell mm -hmm. and they'll be out there and they'll kill you. Yeah. Uh, th you'll be dead. They will not call the cops. The cops will be there with them, mm -hmm. right? They'll beat you flat. And because the Polish men still got a lot of testosterone and they'll fight, they'll protect the beehive. Mm -hmm. I was in Poland last year, uh, also did a trip to Germany, and I can, I can confirm everything that you're talking about with Poland. And I can also, you know, I, I was right next to I Germany. I love Poland, man. I loved it. I, you just got to be professional and yes, polite. Absolutely. <laughs> you, know, I, you know, we went at to, all times. We went to an indoor shooting range uh, just for the afternoon and we were shooting and it was a great time. You're right. Be polite, be very professional because that's what you're going to get from them. I enjoyed my time in Poland and I can actually, I'm excited to go back. I don't know when that's going to be. I hope it's this year, but I loved Poland. I, yeah, I'm, I'm going to leave it there with Poland, but um, I do want to, like this has been a really fascinating conversation, but I do want to switch uh, direction a little bit because again, at breakfast, we had a really, well, all throughout the time you've been here, we've talked a lot about famine. And there, there's reasons I want to talk about famine and, you know, I'm going to bring it back. I hope full circle on some of the other things we've talked about, but you have studied, um, pandemics and you have studied famines. You've obviously as a green beret, you've, you know, been in the military, you've been to Iraq, you've been to Afghanistan, you have participated in a battlefield. Like you've been there in a firefight, you understand warfare at not an elementary level. You understand warfare at a very high, high level. But I wanna talk about, you know, warfare from a non-kinetic energy perspective of, you know, bullets on the battlefield. I wanna talk about warfare because I wanna talk about different types of famine. And, you know, you're probably, uh, you know, have a high level of expertise in that subject as well. So I wanna talk and get your thoughts on famine because you've really educated me over the last couple of days about that, what that really means in the different types. Pandemic and famine and war, they always go together. A story I've told many times now, and I tell it differently every time because um, your memories are uh, malleable even in your own head. Yeah. <laughs> but I was doing this interview maybe three years ago now, and, a, um, and one of my readers for years, uh, she called in and she said, you talk about pandemic, famine, and war, so I made a word for it, pan for war, because people would forget. What's those things that go together again? I say pandemic, famine, war. Mm -hmm. So I made a, uh, an acronym or a, a, a new word, pan for war, pandemic, famine, war, right? Mm -hmm. And she said, you talk about that, that they go together as if you made it up. And mm -hmm. I said, I did, proudly. She said, no, it's in the Bible. Right. And I'm like, oh, man, I have literally plagiarized the Bible. Mm -hmm. You can't make up this stuff. I mean, if you're going to plagiarize, go big. Mm -hmm. right? yeah. But I, I probably, I mean, I'm certain I got it from the Bible, but I just forgot where mm -hmm. I source amnesia. But four horsemen, right? The fourth, fourth one always being argued about, you know, maybe despotism or death, right? Mm -hmm. But pandemic, they knew about it long, 2,000 years ago. They wrote it in the Bible. To me, the Bible is like a survival manual. I mean, I right. think that's the reason so many people that have paid attention to it are alive in such great numbers, mm -hmm. right? Because, I mean, it's got like uh, mechanisms of how to live and get along with each other, right? Mm -hmm. and, and how to not, you know, uh, well, that pandemic, famine, and war go together, mm -hmm. right? And, and so it's very important for anybody that studies war to study famine. I mean, studies war at a high level. I'm not talking about, you know, Navy SEAL kick some doors down or something, mm -hmm. right? You can just stick to the pipe hitting, you know what I mean? Right. That's because there's that pipe hitting level of war, which is a... It's a, more of a technician, right? Mm -hmm. It's a very high level technician, but you know, when you're doing, you know, like Delta Force, take an airplane down or something like that, it's more like a technician, a super, it's like a rod and gun club for athletes, like super athletes, right. super serious people, smart, a lot of training, but you don't need to know much about famine. You don't need to know about pandemic. You don't need to know about much about information war, mm -hmm. except for the people that are really running the unit, right? right. But if you want to start talking about higher levels of warfare and understanding higher levels of warfare, you got to leave the pipe hitting behind, right? Mm -hmm. You got, you know, how to load the torpedoes when you're in the Navy. That's 
part of it, but you know, there's this other thing like where do we get the gas for the submarines, right? Mm -hmm. You know, whatever fuels them, right? right. Nuclear, or whatever. But 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 the point is 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 uh, when it comes to pandemic and famine and war, they do always go together. And to understand famine, it's very important to actually start to study it because fam, I, you know, or pandemic. Between pandemic and famine, I've read about 80 books, right? Mm -hmm. More than 80, right? It's taken many, many years, but now I've noticed a lot of patterns and I've read a lot more than that on war, right? right. And, and spent years in wars, right? Mm -hmm. But so, you know, when you start to combine these things together, you get this other knowledge, right? Uh, and how like artistically dark art that they work together. Let's talk about famine. I've looked for people that, no, let's talk about pandemic. Mm -hmm. Pandemic. Uh, there's a lot of virologists out there and immunologists and vaccinologists and MDs of every flavor, right? And they'll talk about pandemic as if they know actually what it is. They know mm -hmm. the definition of it, but they don't really know how this thing works, right? Right. Uh, I haven't found anybody who's a PhD level in pandemic per se, right? right? There's no pandemicologist. If there is, I haven't found them, and I want to find them. I'll fly to you and see you, right? Mm -hmm. Because I want to talk for like a week. I want to find somebody who's gone total rain man on pandemic yep. that we can start talking about stuff, right? Mm -hmm. Because I've gone semi rain man on it, right? Mm -hmm. And yep. so, and you'll notice certain patterns, right? And and likewise with famine. But uh, let's go back. Let's go to war for a moment. Mm -hmm. Uh, these all become like, you know, like mathematics and art are really sort of the same thing at right. some point, right? And, um, but you, you, you see with war, I've been to a lot of wars and in, in conflicts, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and what, what you'll find is that like in veterinary science, let's say, a mouse and a blue whale are very different. Mm -hmm. diff everything about them seems different. Mm -hmm. So we could talk for a month about how different those things are. <laughs> I mean, right, like, right. but we could turn right around and talk about um, for a month about how you could get some veterinarians out here, biologists, you could talk for another month about how similar they are, right? right? Because a mouse and a blue whale actually are incredibly similar too, mm -hmm. right? And, and the wars are the same way, right? Wars are every one I go to, every conflict I go to, they're all different. Mouse, rat, rabbit, blue whale, they're all different and they're all the same. Mm -hmm. So when you understand that and you start to get to a different level of understanding, you can walk into and go, okay, I've never been in this side of th this kind of aircraft before, but I know one of these things starts the engines and it's probably within reach. Right. <laughs> yeah. It's probably not by my feet. It's probably mm -hmm. right here somewhere or mm -hmm. here or something. You know what I mean? The pilots right. would... Yeah, they would start to figure this thing out, even if it's written in a different language. Before you know it, they'd have that helicopter off the ground, mm -hmm. you know, and they'd probably be able to fly it, right? Right. And it's the same way with these. Now, when it comes to pandemic, uh, one of the things that I've noticed is that, again, let's talk about virologists who talk about, often they talk about pandemic as if they know something about pandemic, mm -hmm. right? And I've never really found many virologists that do. Mm -hmm. They know about viruses, right? Right. Um, and they need to fade over into the study of pandemic. And I don't mean reading a few books on, you know, you know Spanish flu or something, right? right. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, but you know, studying virology is like studying like the curtains and studying the chemicals that they give off when they burn, right? right? right. Okay, it gives off this, that, and blah, 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 whatever, right? Mm -hmm. And so, uh, but that's not what pandemic is. Mm -hmm. that's just virology right. and, and maybe epidemiology as well as those fade into each other, right? And, uh, but then there's people's reactions to it. Mm -hmm. And why does pandemic, I mean, a big pandemic, not some, there's always pandemic. There's pandemics all the time. Every morning I wake up and I'm looking at pandemic news. And mm -hmm. I've been doing this for many years, right? right. Because it's a part of war, right? Mm -hmm. That's why I was one of the very first to notice something was wrong in China with this one, right? Mm -hmm. But, but the bottom line is pandemic. People have certain reactions to pandemic. One of the things that was different about this one was that the government's trying to tell you how dangerous it is. But if you pick up five random books on pandemic, usually it's the opposite. Right. Usually they're trying to tell you, like let's say the yellow fever outbreak in what, 1793 in uh, Philadelphia, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the government's like, oh, it's not that bad. And everybody's like, yeah, it is. I mean, like three of my family, you got, by the way, you go down to Key West mm -hmm. and Ernest Hemingway's house. For anybody that's watching this in Key West or nearby, go to Ernest Hemingway's house, go to the first floor. You'll find a little thing in there that says he bought the house 
<clears throat> from somebody whose family died of yellow fever. Right. Yellow fever is, but the th a problem with yellow fever, it's absolutely amazingly deadly, spread largely by Aedes aegypti mosquito, which is one of the ringtones on my phone, right? <laughs> Aedes aegypti mosquito is that little uh, Asian tiger mosquito with the, yep. what, you know, comes at you like an F-16. They're not like Anopheles or Culex. Anopheles or Culex are like, right, maybe right. we want to get you. Man, Aedes aegypti is like, yep, bam. You know? yeah. and, then they're, and they're super aggressive, and they usually go at you like in the morning or the late afternoon, mm -hmm. right? And they'll get you at night too, but usually morning or late afternoon. But they're, they're absolutely deadly. But what I'm getting to is people's reactions to pandemic can cause famine in various ways. Mm -hmm. For instance, all the farmers, like, we're out of here, man. Everybody here is dying. Like, right. let's say the 1854 cholera outbreak in London, right? Mm -hmm. And the people are like, we got to get out of here. And meanwhile, the, 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 the crown and everybody's like, ah, you know, we're losing our economy. We're losing our power base. Everybody's afraid of the cholera because everybody's, you know, dying because of the Broad Street pump. Well, they didn't know it was the Broad Street pump at that time. They didn't know because Jon Snow was just getting started on figuring it out. Right. There's a good book on it called The Ghost Map, actually. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and anyway, but the bottom line is a lot of people don't understand the dynamics of pandemic. One of the things... Uh, that's very interesting is rich people tend to die in large numbers in pandemic. Mm -hmm. And this is like when the royal family, people are like in the British right now, they're like, oh, they would never do that because da 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 da. I'm like, you obviously haven't studied pandemic because I am telling you, pick up 10 random books, pick up a dozen random books on famine, read them next month, and watch these patterns emerge. Right. Watch as the wealthy people die disproportionately in larger numbers mm -hmm. because they're the ones who can afford the miracle cures first. Masako Ganaha and Chuck Holton and I were down in Panama. We were flying up to Mexico to interview some, some of the invaders coming through, right? Mm -hmm. And on that flight was a Brazilian girl in her 20s and her brother, right? They were clearly quite wealthy, sat beside me in the airplane from between Panama and Mexico. Mm -hmm. And I was like, why? Are you? They spoke English fluently. I'm like, why are you going to the United States? She's going up with her brother to get the jab. Right. And, and they're clearly very wealthy. And I started to, I'm like, how do I explain this to her without making her think I'm crazy? You mm -hmm. know what I mean? And, 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 and I said, you know, I told her, I said, you know, I think you must be from a quite of a, uh, let's say an effective family, yeah. <laughs> like quite rich. If you're just flying up from Brazil to the United States and you're taking a vacation through Mexico on the way mm -hmm. to get the jab, because that, I mean, who can afford to do that? Right. And she said, yeah, I got to get right back to school. She's pretty, she's very smart. I'm like, you know, and I gave her a couple of books. I told her to read. I didn't give them to her, but I mm -hmm. a couple that were on my mind about rich people dying quicker. Let me, I have to scratch my memory for what they were now. But uh, uh, and and I said, you know, you're doing the classic. You're you have access to it. You're jumping the line. Look at the British royal family now. Three have cancer. It may or may not be from the jabs, mm -hmm. you know. But a lot of people are like they would never take it. They would know better. And I'm like, right. obviously, you don't know anything about this. Mm -hmm. That's a supposition. You were a soldier for your career. You know how to spell assumption, right? Yes. Right. So how do you? For those who were not soldiers, ass. you make an ass out of <laughs> you and me. That's how you spell assume, right? One of the first things you learn in special forces is. Thou shalt not assume, if you assume you're in trouble, everybody's going to look at you like you're dirt, right? Yes. We don't assume anything. Oh, I thought you charged the batteries. Okay, mm -hmm. right, yeah. <laughs> so we all left Absolutely. without charged yeah. batteries, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. And, and, it's a, it, it's, and a, a lot of people actually have difficulty in telling the difference between what's an assumption and what's a deduction right. <laughs> for some reason. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe they weren't taught at, that as children. But a lot of people assume that the royal family would not actually fall for it, right? right. And, and like, again, uh, uh, but people never see the cult they're, that they're in. Mm -hmm. They never, uh, in, 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 in royalty or, or, or money or nothing, nothing like that is prophylactic against an actual virus or a bacteria or a fungus or anything. And it's not prophylactic against falling for the sham, right? Right. That not only the sham that this is, obviously a manufactured pandemic, mm -hmm. which maybe the pandemic itself had some truthful components to it, uh, clearly it did. Yeah. But 
that the cure or the prophylactic against it obviously is a weapon, right? Yes. Yes. Now, oligarchs kill oligarchs still. Kings kill kings still. Mm -hmm. And if you want to, a lot of people don't like the British royal family, right? Mm -hmm. And what a perfect way to take them out. Yeah, we're all taking it, you know, you know, yeah. And so look at the Dutch royal family. They're also, the Dutch royal family, they're not the most sophisticated people on the block. Mm -hmm. That they're wealthy and rich and all that doesn't, you can see the think the stupidity that they say all the time, right? <laughs> you're like, you're just an average person. It's like, it's like this, the, the royalty have agreed to behave as royalty and to act as royalty. And we've agreed to behave like you're my king. I'm your king, I'm that actor, and, I, and I'm acting the part as your slave, right? Mm -hmm. That's right. what it really is. But at the end of the day, this is just a stage for a lot of these people. Mm -hmm. I mean, these are not the kings that made the United Kingdom. They have given it away. They are stupid enough to open the doors to destroy their kingdom. Mm -hmm. Why wouldn't they be stupid enough to take the death jab? Mm -hmm. I, I don't mean to insult people with stupidity. They're saying that word, my grandmother, rest her soul, is right now informing me, Michael, do not use that word. Mm -hmm. I can hear her words right now. I hear it. So, yeah. <laughs> and, and, uh, but, and, and, uh, but, uh, but because we just underwent the most severe information campaign in human history. Mm -hmm. Of course, a lot of people fell for it. This was a minefield. I yes. mean, the, the, it was, the, the coercion was severe. You're going to lose your job. They're going to take your children. They're going to do this. They're going to do that. I mean, people like Jordan Peterson fell for it. People like, you know, and he's, a, and he's from, taught here yeah. in Toronto, right? Yes. And I've been on a show a couple of times. He's very, very smart. Mm -hmm. Even he fell for it, right? Yeah. And so it's not like you're stupid for falling for it. It was a trick and highly sophisticated, right? Mm -hmm. and, and why wouldn't the British royal family fall for it? And why would not somebody, when we've got an oligarch versus oligarch series of wars unfolding, why wouldn't somebody take them out? by persuading them to take it. Mm -hmm. So I want to I wanna go to a slightly different topic. Uh, like I said, I hope I can bring this full circle around again. Um, but you've, you've been to many protests around the world. Uh, I think you mentioned yesterday you've been to Hong Kong during protests. You, you've obviously been to the Dutch farmers uh, to their protests. I mean, that's, I think, still going on, and that was pretty, pretty amazing a year ago. But one of the things that fascinates me, because uh, I know you've been on the high wire with Del Bigtree, but one of his associates, Mickey Willis, had did, done a documentary, and he said, you know, universal across the board, every protest movement, uh, without exception almost, at some point will implode from the inside out. Uh, and, you know, I've been to one major, I think pretty significant protest in my life and it was in the city of Ottawa two years ago. And I'm seeing a lot of the signs of, uh, you know, there's, let's say the people that supported the convoy two years ago, a large new faction of that is very divisive and it's tearing it apart. They're not focusing, and I've written a bunch of articles on Twitter about this. They're not focused on the government, uh, the federal, provincial, or even local government. They're focused on crabbing people like me or people like uh, Chris Barber, Tamara Leach. You know, the, the crabbing is going on. And I mean, I wrote about a book about my personal experience at the convoy, and I'm being accused of being a grifter. Okay, because I now, grifter is a key word mm -hmm. that typically comes from the left. Yes, people that are tossing the grifter word, mm -hmm. that's like a, that's a grenade they can't throw far enough. Exactly, far enough. Anybody who uses that word, be, be cautious. Yes, and and so that's a fingerprint. You, you've been involved in many protests. You've met the leaders of yeah, many different hundreds. protests. So, yeah. you know, what is your observation or your experience that you've seen with other protests where the infighting starts, the, the crabbing starts really at a local level? Oh, yeah. Now, the 2014 Umbrella Revolution in Hong Kong, I did not go to that one because I was in the 2014 coup in Thailand, mm -hmm. so I couldn't be at both. There was a lot of infighting at, during that actions in Thailand. I was at the 2010 and the 2014 coups in Thailand. I was at both of those. And I don't mean I was just there, showed up for a day. I was there for months before both of them in like 
unbelievable number. I was sleeping on the streets with them, right? Mm-hmm. I was in a huge amount of protest. I wasn't protesting. I was watching them and the mm-hmm. learning what's going on and trying to figure out who's who in the zoo. And they, they all start fighting each other, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, so it's not ties fighting ties. It is ties fighting ties. But I mean, but it's, it's just humans fighting humans. Mm-hmm. Now you go to Hong Kong in 2014. I was not there for that one. I was there for the 2019-20 Hong mm-hmm. Kong, right? Now in 2019, the Hong Kongers didn't fight each other much, actually. And why not? Because they would say every day, they would tell me, in 2014, the Umbrella Revolution fell apart because of infighting. Mm-hmm. So we have agreed this time not to infight, to resist infighting by whatever we do. Don't infight. They're like, we had a lot of inertia then. We started the infight, and it took, took a lot of time to get over it. Mm-hmm. And then, well, they lost critical time in that 2014 mm-hmm. And uh, anyway, they've been taken now. But th- they would say it every day. Now, at the at the, uh, I've been to a lot of American protests. I was, uh, I went to January six. Mm-hmm. I was out in Portland, and oh, so many, so many. Right. I mean, over over decades in different places, right? Mm-hmm. Just watching. Um, um, and uh, one of the things that causes infighting too is agent provocateurs who are inserted, right? Mm-hmm. Or there are some people who are just natural splitters. Right. And psychologists actually call it splitting, or at least in the, I think mm-hmm. it might be in the American DSM. I right. can't remember. It's been many years since I read that. But, any, but it, it may or may not be in DSM. I, I read DSM cover to cover. Oh, wow. uh, yeah. You're the one. <laughs> I, 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 I read yeah. so much. But, but the bottom line is um, uh, uh, the, there are people that, especially psychopaths, will tend to split each other. Mm-hmm. Actually, if you've ever had a stalker, Stalkers tend to, and I've had a few stalkers, and um, stalkers are quite different than trolls. Right. Anybody who's really had a real stalker, mm-hmm. a lot of people have asked me at times, is so-and-so a stalker? And I'm like, no. And or, how do you know? I didn't tell you much more. I said, because you asked me if he's a stalker. If somebody's a real stalker, mm-hmm. you won't be asking anybody. You're going to be like, that guy's a stalker. Yeah. Stalkers yeah. are, there's hardcore trolls that, Mm-hmm. But be, once you've had a real stalker, mm-hmm. they are in this, they are like, it's like the difference between I heard some fireworks and I'm in a firefight. Yeah. And stalkers are hardcore. They're on you like in there. They go quite insane. They can be very dangerous. Yes. Stalkers kill people every single day of the year. Uh, and they will, they often do splitting. They're going to find out where you work. They're going to find out everything about you. They're going to try to make your kids leave. You're going to try to make your dog hate you. Mm-hmm. They're going to try to isolate you and fix you and destroy you, right? Yes. And so but it, so if you're ever asking, is so-and-so a stalker? The answer is, again, that's like asking, is this little breeze a hurricane? Right. You know, you're in yeah. a stalker, you're getting blown down the road by this stuff. <laughs> it's true, like, because my experience is there is a, a, a core of people that, you know, I did work with at the convoy, and I don't typically engage in these kind of discussions because I find th- there's two reasons. One. First and foremost, it really is divisive. Our focus needs to be on our government officials, elected officials and bureaucrats. That's where 100% of your focus should be. But the second thing is, more importantly maybe than the first, is it's just demoralizing to the people that are asking you for help and are supporting you in your effort because somebody like me fell into the convoy almost by accident and because of that experience, I've got the means to do more. I mean, doing this interview is because I went to the convoy two, two years prior. You and I right. would have never met. That's so, one of the things about conflict mm-hmm. is you meet new friends you would never have met. Absolutely. And you meet them very quickly. Yes, you do. Because it's high energy circumstance. Yeah, and they become like family. But if somebody says, what's their last name? You're like, I have no yeah. idea. But you're yeah. bonded. You yeah. are bonded yeah. in that common experience. That's true. I've seen that a lot. But, you know, I find um, it's really disappointing because there's a lot more work to do. There's so much more work to do in this country. But if people can, you know, you're going back to mice, if people can check their ego, focus on the perpetrators of your, your unhappiness, your, your loss of pride in your country, focus on the elected officials. Focus on things you can control and focus on things you can influence. Stop focusing on things that are in your circle. That's your of, military training. Yeah. And that's an important way of thinking. Mm-hmm. You, you said it yesterday. Being able to delineate between what I can influence and what I can control versus what's just going to happen. Yeah. You, you've got no control over certain things, what Prince Charles is going to do. 
or, you know, let, I jokingly say the lizard people, you have no control over this kind of stuff. Focus on what you can control and what you can influence and try to try to convert your influence into something you can control. All the rest, noise. Monitor it, you know, be interested to a, at a, a 10,000 foot view, but don't get tied up in that. You can't do anything about it. So I question the motivations of people that are going to be uh, crabbing, you know, or, you know, coming after me and, and maybe people like Keith Wilson and Eva Chipiuk, who were, you know, the key lawyers that came to the convoy and helped us. Uh, Tamara Leach gets accused of things, so does Chris Barber, and it's ridiculous. They did something special for this country. It can be very difficult, even impossible, to sort what's actually crabbing yes. or, or, or an actually an honest uh, difference yeah. uh, versus uh, somebody who's actually sent there to split you. Absolutely. And so, you know, with that in mind, there's this one question that I get all the time, two questions really. People always say, uh, and I'm going to use this as a, a closing thoughts uh, for this interview. But, you know, they always say to me two things. Tom, what do you think is going to happen? And what should I do? So with that in mind, I'm going to leave the, the final thoughts to you. What do you think is going to happen? And what should I do? Uh, it's really obvious uh, what's happening. Is there a replacement uh, invasion is unfolding? Uh, the information war is intense. It's becoming more intense. Clearly, we're going to have massive famines. There's a long flash to bang on this. Mm -hmm. I first started warning about, warning about famine in about January of 2020. And the reason I started warning was because I started to sense this could be a real pandemic. Mm -hmm. I was actually calling it pandemic back when you would get knocked off of social media for calling it that, mm -hmm. which was interesting. Mm -hmm. It's an interesting information trick, right? Yes. And, uh, and, and, then, and then sometime later in that year, I'm like, wait a minute. This is an actual who's Zoom and who moment. This is a very sophisticated trick, right? And, uh, and the likes of which we still haven't figured out all the edges, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, they've taken generations to develop this orchard of, of, of information uh, war, and it's quite uh, smooth, right? Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so, but at the bottom line is what's going to happen? Clearly, there is an open effort to knock out Caucasians. Yes. That's open. It's obvious. Only the densest among us wouldn't see it at this point. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, a lot of the Caucasians are like, ah, you're racist. I'm like, have fun with that. Yeah. And have fun dying, right? Moving you know, on. I'm moving have, on. Yeah, yeah. Have fun in Sweden getting raped because mm -hmm. guess what? It's over. We warned you. You didn't listen. I'm not coming to help. Yes. You know, it's that simple, right? You know, uh, you know it, it, and at some point, it becomes a do not rescue sign to wear the enemy flag on your, you got a Che thing on the back of your bumper or even a rainbow flag. Mm -hmm. uh, even though, you know, I mean that at some point you're like, I'm not going to help you because yeah. you're clearly trying to take my life, right? Mm -hmm. And the lives of the people I love. Yes. And it doesn't mean that you're intentionally doing it, but you've fallen into the, You're wearing that uniform. You're right? a useful idiot. Yeah, you're at, at a minimum, you're a useful idiot. Mm -hmm. And remember, useful idiots are killed in this story. That's how it goes. This is an old story. It's old as time. Useful idiots are used to, to knock out enemy forces. This is like Sun Tzu, mm -hmm. uh, you know, 2024 version, right? Yeah. And uh, it's not like Sun Tzu. This is totally Sun Tzu yes. in action. <laughs> the acme of fighting is to win without fighting, right? Mm -hmm. and, and so uh, now, but a lot of this will be fighting. It'll be violence in the street. You've got people coming in, like gangs. The prisons have been dumped out in Venezuela. Yeah. We've seen a lot of those. You should see some of the videos I've published. AK-47 tattooed next to his eye. You know, clear uh, Trinde Agua, probably, you know, gangster. Uh, I've actually asked some of them at times, are you a member of that gang? They'll be like, oh, yeah. You know, and, and, and they clearly are. They're all tatted up, coming, acting like it. Uh, and, you know, there's a lot of Hezbollah coming in from Venezuela. A lot of people don't realize that Hezbollah, actually, there's a huge presence in Venezuela. And mm -hmm. they speak Spanish fluently. Right. And their, their, their soccer team is Venezuelan, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, they can mm -hmm. co- Iranians can fly to Venezuela right now and get a passport. Wow. Venezuelan passport. Right. Uh, Venezuela has a very close relationship with Chinese Communist Party and Russia. Right now, the Iranians are helping the Venezuelans accru acquire more and more drones and more and more of the weapons that are being used to close the Suez Canal, right? right. They can close the Panama Canal. Mm -hmm. It will come at this rate. At this rate, do not be surprised 
in the paradigm, it's clear that Guyana and Venezuela are probably going to go to war, right? Mm -hmm. And if they do, that's going to get sporty. And for various reasons, there's a lot of energy. Guyana's got a big pork chop hanging around its neck, and they've got no means to defend themselves. And the bottom line is China and Russia and Iran, they would love a piece of that energy, right? Mm -hmm. So they're going to help Venezuela get it, right? right? right. And and can shut us down in the Panama Canal. Anyway, not to go into this, but the bottom line, what's going to come next? Um, I'm setting some table so that you understand how this looks to me, right? Mm -hmm. Which we could go on for weeks about this, but the bottom line is global famines, right? right. Doesn't mean everybody's going to starve, but a lot of people will die of starvation, mm -hmm. right? And they'll die of starvation and they'll, that'll drive that hop, that human osmotic pressure, that push and the pull of migration, that will push them up through places like the Darien Gap, push them from Bahamas, not just, not Bahamian so much, but people using it. Look, China has a huge harbor there in, in the Bahamas. Like, yeah. I don't know, 60 miles off the Florida coast or so. Mm -hmm. It's very close. It's a big harbor. You can see it on Google Earth, right? right. We were just, we just came from Bahamas, right? Right. And because of that, right? Bahamas is used as a waypoint for people coming up on Florida beaches, like at Jupiter and Vero Beach, right? right. They, they literally launch from there and they end up in Miami and other places. And mm -hmm. de depending on where they leave in Bahamas, they come up in the Keys because there's many different islands, right? Mm -hmm. And um, But the bottom line is the United States is now surrounded and most Americans don't even get it. Most Americans have no idea how important the Panama Canal is to mm -hmm. them. Or not just Panama Canal, but Panama itself right because of the location 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 yes. central america is being taken by china mm -hmm. masako ganaha and i again we were just in belize we were just in guatemala and honduras and el salvador and panama looking at these things watching how the ccp is coming in like a glacier mm -hmm. keep in mind the chinese they're very smart about warfare mm -hmm. most americans can't even recognize a war unless it has a bunch of tanks in it right they, th this idea of warfare that most Americans and Canadians and a lot of Europeans have, we're being hit with a type of war they can't even see. It's like a virus, right? Mm -hmm. And it's, they're, they're coming in, they're taking in positions in our infrastructure. We've got different uh, oligarchical structures coming in, taking their pieces of the pie. Eventually, as you've already talked about, I do think you'll see China and India fighting in Canada. Mm -hmm. We already see the Sikhs and the Hindus you know, having, right, you know, people move their fight over, you know, to, to other countries and the fish, the fish fight over there, right? Yeah. Like the Kurds fighting in Germany against Arabs and Kurds fighting against Turks in Germany and Kurds mm -hmm. fighting against Kurds. I love Kurds. I get along with them great. I get along with Sikhs everywhere I go in the world. But you can see when you bring fish into another fish tank, they'll bring the American Revolutionary War was basically bringing wars that we already had in Europe and we fought them here. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was just a, Yes. Trans we just, you know, moved that war over there, right? And, and, and my, I had two, at least two grandfathers fought in the American Revolutionary War, right? Mm -hmm. and, and, and again, it was just bringing those civil wars into, into the Americas. Well, we saw it on the video, uh, Mocha. Uh, he was formerly of uh, Rebel News. He's broken off. He's doing his own. But he was recording a fight between, you know, Indians and Kalistani Indians in the city of Calgary the other day. Most uh, Americans won't know what Kalistani Indians are, but yeah, so, you know, I walk around in my neighborhood and there's a lot of signs. I mean, Calistani Indians. They have their yellow flag. and Their flag, their, their bumper stickers, yeah. or it's hanging from their, their rear view mirrors in their cars and stuff. But, you know, they are considered, uh, they're fighting for independence within India themselves, but they're, they've been trying to pressure the Canadian government to support their independence in there. And one of our elected officials, uh, Jagmeet Singh, he's the leader of the New Democratic Party here, um, he's kind of entangled in that whole sort of movement. As oh, well. it, it'll split your government. It this will. is what they do in the United States. Is you go to Glendale, California, and you'll see like the Armenians want us to join yeah. them against. Uh, and Masako and I were in Armenia last year. Actually, mm -hmm. I love Armenia. The Armenian people are great. They want us to get involved in their fight with the Turks, mm -hmm. right? And uh, and uh, or the Koreans have a comfort women statue right. there next to the library. I've been there a mm -hmm. dozen times probably, and the the, the Koreans want us to fight against Japanese, right? Right. They put these statues in north of Atlanta and what's it called, Brookville or whatever it's called. I w we went up there as well. Mm -hmm. I went to their statues in different places. They're trying to get the local people involved in their fight. Now, 
in information campaigns, which is something I study quite a lot, that's also how you, that can accomplish numerous things at once. Mm -hmm. It's like a Carver matrix of information war, yes. right? And so you, you, uh, you can get Americans fighting Americans, like, oh, why are you supporting the Koreans? Why are you supporting the Japanese? Why are you supporting, you know what I mean? And, and, and they, so they, and, they, and they get the Japanese and the Koreans fighting each other. You can atomize, you know, in, in information war, it's atomization. Mm -hmm. Women fighting men, gays fighting non-gays. Uh, you know, dogs fighting cats, you know, everybody's fighting everybody. Sikhs versus Hindus, but a lot of this is organic. Mm -hmm. So you'll find organic fights and then fertilize those. And then you can create fights out of thin air as well, right? Mm -hmm. But the way you create those fights out of thin air is like that associate professor of Jewish studies at Shanghai University. Mm -hmm. He's going to find the firmware places where he can tweak it. Yes. And he'll go, okay, I can get these guys to cooperate with them based on this, mm -hmm. or you know, I'll get them to fight these guys based on that. The, what, what you do is you put a microscope under the things that make them fight mm -hmm. and then make it look big. Like you see the Malaysians and the Indonesians always fighting about musical appropriation, right? Mm -hmm. I spent so much time in Asia. I see the fights over there. You get back to the United States and blacks are like, ah, oh, they're appropriating our music, the blues and all this. And I'm like, and they think it's something here. It's like you're just another group of suckers in a fight that happens all over the world. Yes. I see it everywhere. It's the same cookie-cutter fight. Mm -hmm. and it's like, again, make it, getting the Malaysians to fight the Indonesians over, culture, over musical appropriation. Or over, like, say the Japanese were wearing, uh, uh, there were some people wearing kimonos up in New York at some train station or something mm -hmm. for some show. And, and they're trying to make it look like right-wing Japanese are angry that people are wearing kimonos. Right. But that's not true. The Japanese are like, actually, the Japanese are the opposite. The Japanese are like, if you wear a kimono or whatever, it's actually respectful. It's like, it's like you're, mm -hmm. you're actually, it's, they're like honored that you are. Right. But the information warriors try to make it look like, hey, the Japanese are complaining against the Koreans right. or somebody for wearing, they'll get, you know, the next thing you know, everybody's dialing in and you really do get a food fight going. Mm -hmm. Then it's a real food fight, right? right. And, then, and then you've got the Americans joining with their side and mm -hmm. anyway. Well, I, I see the food fights happening here in Canada. I mean, go on Twitter and you, you'll notice like there, there's this ecosystem of, of people in Twitter, right? right. A lot of people that I follow. And what I find really disheartening at times is, you know, people are so sensitive to, uh, and, and they're so easily offended. Like you can, you can have one little faux pas that you didn't fully understand the amount we're of information. To be offended. Yeah, we're taught to be offended. And, you know, one little faux, ta, faux pas, and then next thing you know, you're getting, a, you're getting hammered by somebody who was supporting you for the last year on something you've been working on. We're, we're too unwilling to sit down, have a, a logical uh, discussion. Nobody's ever called me up and said, hey, I just want to talk to you. You were talking about this on a podcast. I don't like what you said, but I'd like to discuss it. No, what I get is in return, and, and I think this speaks to a large, uh, you know, uh, this happens a lot. You don't have the conversations. You just get attacked on social media. Right. Right. It's like, where did you, where did you learn to uh, do that as an effective way of solving a problem? Because that doesn't solve a problem. Right. It creates a bigger one and it's further fracturing all of us. Right. We're stronger when we're, we're together. We're weaker when we're divided. Oh, yeah. And they and, want to divide it. Atomize it. Yes. And, and we do it to ourselves because we're not the most sophisticated collective group of people in Canada pushing back against someone like Justin Trudeau or Jagmeet Singh or something. Or, and we're poisoned, right? Yes. And remember, just like a physical poison, like that's mm -hmm. put into your, you're going to be served a nice, beautiful, big meal, yes. right? Yes. And then it's one <laughs> drop of poison. Yes. Iocane powder or whatever, yeah, right? Yeah. And, and it's like, and it's going to be one drop of little, you know, yeah. and, uh, and, and it's going to, and, and, and it's the same with information. Yeah. Like, that's why I go after Joe Rogan all the time. Right. And people are, why do you go after Joe Rogan? Why don't you get on a show? He's the biggest podcast. You'll reach a hundred million people, blah, 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 whatever. I'm like, that's why I go after Joe Rogan. I could right. easily get on a show. I was, you know, people are all the, I know so many people that know him personally. Mm -hmm. They're like, I'll call Joe or I just talked with Joe. And I'm like, no. I'm not going on the Joe Rogan right. show. Joe Rogan is a clear operator. Right. He is clearly serving a big meal of look at all these incredible people he has on a show and let's smoke some dope together. Yeah. He's clearly he's clearly helping our enemies both sell dope and dope up our young people. Yeah. And so 
the reason I go after him is he is the biggest. Information war is very important. Like, let's go back to Stalin. Let, making the, the name Kulak evil. Mm -hmm. And most people go along with it. Yeah, Kulaks are evil because Kulaks, in the, and they, they, they start to say, this is what Kulaks do. This is the reason your food prices are high. Da, 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 yeah. da. They took all your wealth. That's why you're poor. And then people go along with it and they go, and you're a Kulak. So right. then they hang it around your neck. Yes. Now, DEI. When I first heard, it was many years ago, when somebody said, um, when somebody said, diversity is our strength. Mm -hmm. When I first heard that, see, in my mind, that inflates to something good back then. Mm -hmm. Because I'm like, yeah, it is. Because I, when I've been on different teams, we got people that speak different languages. Yes. Yeah, I definitely want some diversity because if everybody's like me, then we're a lot weaker. We need to have yes. you know, people that know how to do different stuff. But and so it's easy to get people to buy into that in the beginning, because mm -hmm. in the beginning it's really light. It's yes. a light touch, and then they then they change the meaning. Yes, absolutely the meaning. true. Absolutely true. And it's it is a bait and switch. At with, first, with when words. I said that, I was like, I, I, mm -hmm. somebody brought it up, and I said, yeah, diversity is our strength yes. or a strength. And I published that. that was a long time ago, years yeah. ago. And and then a, a few guys that I trusted were like, no, you see what they're doing. I was like, no, and I looked at it, and I was like, oh, yeah, ah, thanks for pointing that out. Right, right. I almost stepped on. I did step on that landmine, right. but I won't step on mm -hmm. it twice. Right, right. Now, now that you, you got to have people you trust watching your back sometimes, mm -hmm. all the time. Yes, and that's what our job is to watch their back as well, because we, we can't focus on everything. Right. We have to focus on what right. we can focus on and render accurate reports. Mm -hmm. And so words, right? The precision of words, and you know, even recently, I. I I wrote an article on Twitter, which is where I hang out, or X, whatever it's called. I'm talking about precision with words. It's actually X. I'm coming around, but you know, I don't want to open this can of worms on the, the anti-Semitism. But I wrote an article recently about that, saying, "Look, just because I ask questions doesn't mean I'm anti-Semitic. I have the right and the duty and the responsibility to ask hard questions because there's a lot of horrific things happening." And I can't be afraid of being accused of something that I'm not to shut me up. Yeah. I'm going to look at the facts and pick apart, tease out all the facts to make an informed decision. Yeah. I am not going to fall for your trick of calling me a Russian th sympathizer or a propagandist because I'm asking questions about where the hell all the Canadian money is going that's going to the Ukraine. I want to know, I want to ask questions about what Israel is doing what Hamas is doing, and I want to be very precise about the difference between a non-combatant and a soldier. Like these are things that I believe I have a responsibility to discuss, right. and I'm not going to stop because you're going to call me an anti-Semite. That's ridiculous. It's immature. Shows your level of it's manipulative. Manipulative. People hate to be manipulated. Yes, that's one of the things that humans hate the most is being manipulated yes. psychologically for the advantage yes. of somebody else. And when Call them what they are. They are manipulators. Your yes. magic wand is broken. It's in the fireplace. Mm -hmm. The moment somebody pulls the pin on you're a racist or you're an anti-Semite, yeah. I'm like, you need to defend that right now. Yeah. And I'm on offense. I'm not like, oh, I got Jewish friends. No, it's like, no, we're, I'm total offense. You're a manipulator unless you can prove it. Right? Prove it. Yes. Prove it. Exactly. Prove it. Exactly. I'm going to be on your ass, right? Yeah. You know, it's like, you know, and because yeah. that's when... I have been a supporter of Israel all of my life mm -hmm. until it started to fade away. Boom. When they did the death jab and forced Americans to get it, to come to Israel, I'm like, that's it. Yeah. I warned and warned and warned. There is a line. There is a real line. You can't cross this line and still get my support. Right. If you cross that line, I mean it. And the same with Trump. Mm -hmm. Same with Trump. He's still pushing that jab, right? Mm -hmm. And people, too many people give him a pass. And they're like, well, he gave us a choice. He didn't give me anything. Mm -hmm. I'm an American. I don't ask some guy, a real estate dude, if I should be able to take ivermectin. Who the hell is he? Yeah. You know what I mean? <laughs> you know, seriously. It's true. You know, I'm never going to vote for something named Biden or Clinton. I mean, they're absolute trash. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, when you've got somebody that's like, it's the best vaccine in the world, you know, and yeah. We rushed it through. This is 2024. Mm -hmm. This is the last days. This is what Easter weekend. You know, if, if, if you're still pushing that at this point, you're the enemy, right? 
straight up. Mm -hmm. I mean, because this is clearly killing a huge number of people, mm -hmm. right? Yes. You're clearly from the other camp. Now, you keep in mind, people will always go, well, who do you want to be president, him or Biden? Obviously not Biden. He's not a president anyway. He's a meat puppet. Mm -hmm. Biden is a condom for the CCP and the World Economic Forum. That's yeah. all he is. When he's disposed of, he'll be thrown out on the mm -hmm. street, right? Nobody has any use for Biden. He's a piece of trash, right? Mm -hmm. He's always been that. That's why he's in that position. He's not really the president, right? right. This is an oligarchical fight. These are the champions, not really champions, but actors that they put up. And we get, we get these choices because we accept that. Right. We accept it. Like Governor Abbott in Texas, mm -hmm. I was one of the first people going against him. And people were going, why are you going against him? Especially my, I'm, I'm in Texas a lot. Mm -hmm. my, my Texas conservative friends, which is, you know, I'm very conservative. You know, it's, it's deep in my, I'm from Polk County, Florida. It doesn't get more conservative than that, right? right. I mean, it is deep down inside it can't be washed out right, right. And, uh, and 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 uh, just like rfk can't be washed out from liberal right, right. right. he is that thing right? right so just because i'm calling trump out for the death jab doesn't mean rfk he's going to be a gun grabber right. he is clearly going to be a gun grabber mm -hmm. right and uh you know it, it, i was with brett weinstein down in daring very smart man i'm mm -hmm. so happy he came with us and he's been very helpful in getting word out about this and Brett was, you know, trying to assure me that because he he's in, an advisor to, you know, uh, Kennedy, that, you know, that that, you know, Kennedy's not going to come to grab guns. I'm like, I'm going to go with my intuition and he will. I know he will because he is as liberal as I am conservative. Right. And that will not wash out. Mm -hmm. Right. You, there's no there's nothing that's going to make. Actually, as I was younger, I was a lot more liberal than I was now. I used to not care if you want to go smoke dope, go ahead and smoke your dope. Right. Mm -hmm. But now we're in a state of war. Right. Mm -hmm. Now we're in a state of war and you got clowns like Joe Rogan out pushing this stuff while the Chinese are making billions of dollars on it. It's not the old dope that was just growing up on the mountains in the Himalaya. Right. Mm -hmm. This is supercharged. We got thousands separately, but related Thousands of Americans dying per month of fentanyl that the Chinese are supplying, right? Mm -hmm. They are clearly at war with us. They're clearly dumbing down our, our males that are, you know, many of them are not men anymore. We got these high testosterone guys coming through the Darien Gap. They'll kill them. They'll, mm -hmm. they'll come here. They'll kill people and they'll take their homes. That's how this rolls. We got gangsters, prisons being dumped out. Uh, you know, Amer and Texans keep saying, don't mess with Texas. I'm like... What do you mean don't mess with Texas? It's being invaded 24-7, and you're just wearing a cowboy hat saying don't mess with Texas, right? right? <laughs> Meanwhile, you know, Governor Abbott, uh, you know, when I go against him, uh, people are like, who did you want? Beto? Beto to be the governor? No, Beto is another condom for them. But he, when you put Beto against next to Abbott, then Abbott looks like he's a superstar. Right. But if Beto wasn't there, you'd say, I would never vote for that guy. Right. And now Beto will take busloads filled with the invaders, no, Pete, you can't say invaders clutches pearls, you know, yeah. clutches microphone. You know, that you know, you can't you can't you can't say invader, you know, so many people have told me that. You can't say invader. It'll turn people off. It'll turn I get it. Guess what? I totally know the Overton window. I live in the same world. You know, I travel the world. I know I can turn people off with the truth. But it's very important for those few who will listen to it. You can't lie what's happening. Five dozen of them just got arrested for attacking National Guard and breaching and breaking and invading the United States. Were they migrants? They literally invaded and pushed through the National Guard. Right. Right? I mean, it's like yeah. you can't make up this stuff. Mm -hmm. Right? So Abbott, he is the governor of Texas. He's really the world economic sector chief for Texas is what he really is. I mean, he is really – so he takes his busload filled with the aliens – the invaders, and he sends them up to places like New York, mm -hmm. and and everybody goes, yay! He's teaching the Blue Devils what's going on, right. you know. And uh, I'm like, is he really? He's, just he's helping redistribute. The, he's clearing the yeah. banks of the Rio Grande. He's putting them deeper into our heart. Right. He's he's pulling more in, mm -hmm. right? And now, I mean, there is no way the United States or Europe gets out of this. Canada, let's say North America, you're not getting out of this without severe bloodshed. Right. And they're clearly coming to kill us. Mm -hmm. That is so obvious that it's, at this point, here's the thing. Some people will be looking at this 10 years from now. A lot fewer will be, will be alive then than now. That's mm -hmm. clear, right? right? 
And some people may see this and go, wow, he got this, this, and this wrong, but he got these things right. And we had we only listened, right? Because right. we're going to get some things wrong. Right. But the general trajectory is global famines are on the way. Okay. The invasions are increasing. Our critical mass of our... our it, all these other anthro insulas, these human islands of different types of people, they're all, one of the things that happens during famines and wars is groups, group with groups, right? They're going to go with their own group, mm -hmm. which is obviously, we're outnumbered. Right. And, right? So you're, you're just average, everyday Joe citizen, Jill citizen, whatever. What do you do? Well, I mean... At this point, we have reached a point where they didn't do what we've been saying to do for years, and now you're going to go into a kinetic war. Yeah. It's happening. It's yeah. going to happen. Right. I mean, you've already got the maid stuff going on. Mm -hmm. They're literally killing people softly, right? Yeah. Literally euthanizing people coming in with a bad knee, and you're dead before lunch. Yeah. Americans don't know what maid is, though. It's medical assistance in dying, a case that's just happened uh, in Canada. It was a, a father of a 27-year-old. I think year it's old, in the same day. Yeah, a 27-year-old 20, autistic daughter. Uh, for whatever reason, she became aware that MAID was an option. Uh, she elected MAID. The father went to court to try to stop it, and a judge just ruled that, nope, she's of sound mind. She can kill herself. This is literally Nazi doctor stuff. Yes. I read that book a long time ago when it first came out, The Nazi Doctors. Mm. I, I should read it again because back then when I read it, I thought, wow, I'm glad that's over. Not realizing, you know, when I was stationed in Germany, I speak German, right? So I've been to a lot of the things and mm -hmm. we always would say, I can't believe the Germans fell for this stuff. Yes. <laughs> and now I see it. I see yeah. it. It's yeah. like a lot of people are just little gears in a watch and they don't even know what time it is yeah you know like border patrol just doing my job sir loading them up on the bus yeah. and the bus driver's just doing his job yeah. and the guy at the, at the you know at the station down in texas is checking them in and then they get their then next thing you know they're free on the streets mm -hmm. they give them these papers that tell them when do they have to report to court which is like years in the and yeah. they we are literally I, I keep telling the border patrol guys you you you, you understand you will not get your retirement right you will not get it yeah uh if you're retiring very soon you may get it for some period yes but we're going to go into hyperinflation yeah and i've seen countries i've been in countries with hyperinflation mm -hmm. it's over right it's all over and you're helping it happen mm -hmm. right like look at when money dies is a good book on this even though it was in the 1920s it's a good book because it's well written mm -hmm. and it talks about how the hyperinflation happens and i've seen it happen like when i lived in poland when everything was melting yeah. down and, oh, yeah. and i was in east germany and all this and the hyperinflation and what was it thirteen thousand percent or something for a while i can't remember mm -hmm. it was something ridiculous like that right. it was great for me man i have these huge meals and stuff and maybe like four of us eating like three bucks four bucks you know yeah, yeah. you know i mean it was like I mean, how do they even afford this stuff? Well, you know? I, I would I would suggest people do uh, the crash course with with Chris Martinson like that. I got a wealth of knowledge as a Canadian studying economics just through that yeah. course. That was years ago. He I goes into he, the mathematics of it and yeah, the, you know the uh, it's very you know, detailed. exponential. Yeah, I mean you you get to the point where it's like Rrrp. yeah, get on his mailing list. It's a really good resource just to understand economic indicators, things that are coming towards us. I actually, I follow Chris. Yeah. He went with us to the Dairy and Gap. Right. I mean, he's so smart that I asked him like 50 times to come. Yeah. And he finally came, actually. Yep. And so he, and then when he got back from Dairy, and he did exactly what I hoped he would do, see things in ways that I don't see them. Right. Because if he's just going to regurgitate what I've already seen, then it's not as helpful. I mean, yeah. it's helpful because he tells yeah. his audience. Yes. But I would rather him, like Masako Ganaha, when she goes, she sees things in a very different way. It's extremely helpful. You know, she'll see it through the Japanese lens, right? Mm -hmm. And through her experience set, mm -hmm. right? And, and, and Brett Weinstein did the same. Laura Loomer, they all see it through their own different right. lens. Right. And it's incredibly helpful. So I, I know that you are, are very well acquainted with Steve, Steve Bannon. Uh, and one of the things that Steve Bannon talks about often is, you know, localism has national consequences. Yeah, and and that's kind of the drum that Bannon's right beating. about that. Yeah, I've been beating that drum as well because you talk about, 
you know, people go into their tribes. Right. Um, you know, like-minded people are banding together. And, I, and I've spoken in places here across Canada, uh, never as far as British Columbia. I've unfortunately never been there. I've been right. almost everywhere else. But, you know, there are meetings all across Canada. In every place that I've been asked across Canada to, to go to, I'm with a group of like-minded small groups that are banding together. They're talking about localism and in parallel societies. You know who you need to talk with? Ann Vandersteel. Yes, I do. She went to Darien four times already. Yeah. Tactical civics. Mm -hmm. She knows, like, she's rain man on this stuff. Right. So I, I think an, an important thing with this is, you know, when you, you focus on localism, it is, you know, barter, it's security, it's many, many different things. But I often say, you know, there's always these school board, we see meetings of school board meetings all the time in Canada and the US, all these trustees, you know, parents go in to speak, next thing you know, they're getting kicked out. The FBI in the United States wanted to investigate Christian parents as domestic terrorists. You know, Canadians, they go, they get representation, they get to speak for five minutes to their elected council, and they say something you don't like, next thing you know, they're, they're shutting their mics off and kicking them out. My feeling is you got to focus, hyper-focus locally and go into every one of those positions. Let's say there's eight uh, student council, or not student council, uh, city council positions. There's eight. You go get 80 people. Ten of you go to every one of those positions and you make a pact. Yeah. We don't care if eight of yeah. you, uh, which one of us out of the ten gets right. that one seat. We're going to overwhelm it and right. guarantee one of ours. So I think, you know, localism, do it to your school boards, do it to your councils. But focus locally on what you can control and what you can influence. Right. And who cares what the lizard people are doing in Antarctica? Who cares? Yeah. Focus on what you can control in yeah. influence. Yeah. I'm like, no more lizard people stuff, please. <laughs> I want to see some scales. Yes. Or, or change yes. the subject. Yep. So I, I think we should sort of end it there. We've been going for a while. Um, but I want to say, you know, for, for people who watch this, uh, if you want to find out more about Michael, go to uh, Michael Yon, all one word, dot com. So that's Y-O-N, and I'll put it in there. Go to michaelyon.com, and it looks like to me, being, having been on your website, you're on every social media platform uh, that I could think of. Uh, you are an author of six books. Uh, one of them, um, which is um, Danger Close, it's the first yeah. book you wrote. And we talked about it before the interview started, that there yeah. was... There was over 20 books now. You were the first to publish a book called Danger Close. Yeah. And there's about 20 more after that. But by more the way. More than one, 20. I was yeah. surprised. Yeah. Why do so many people make the same title? I know. Because it, yeah. uh, it doesn't make sense for them because the people can't find their titles. Yeah. My, my title to my book was, uh, was, was, I didn't come up with the title to the book. A good friend of mine, Sammy, came up with it, who was at the Windsor Bridge during the time of the Canadian convoy. You know, Justin Trudeau invoked the Emergencies Act. Uh, the title of my book is The People's Emergency. Mm. You know, Canadians responded. C Canadians uh, and people around the world, it was a manifestation and they acted locally. Yeah, they went to Ottawa, but it was a local action. And it was because they... The, 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 the convoy itself and all over the world were manifestations of the mistreatment in the tyranny of our governments. And people are doing this all over the world. And so you can join on a local action, like I mentioned Harold Jonker and another friend of mine, Brian, and, and people from the Niagara region that came together locally. And they had a strategic national consequence by going to Ottawa. And that's an important thing. you you, you got to find your people in your yeah, community absolutely and build from there and, and the most important thing but i want to that, say that's our, our enemies want to make us not trust each yes, other it, exactly because that because they know when we're together we have strength yes and that's why i wanted to ask you your thoughts about you know the infighting but the last thing i want to say there's a there's a great um uh, expression or slogan that's gone out and i think chris sky he's a he's a pretty well-known canadian guy he he was saying in the beginning do not comply I think a couple years into this now, we have to evolve and in, 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 in there's a, a Veterans for Freedom guy named Mark, I've never met him, but he wrote a, a message to Drew McGilvery and he said, you know, it's not now about do not comply, it's now do not rely. 
the more you rely on the government, the more vulnerable you are. And, and I think we can say that safely across the world. The, the, the societies that are more government dependent are much closer to Marxist communist, communist systems than those who are highly, highly independent systems, right? So yeah, they want you relying on them for everything. For everything. Uh, like, you know, standing in line for hours for meat in Poland. Yes. I've seen so much of that stuff. Mm -hmm. East Germany, Poland. Yeah. Czechoslovakia back when it was that. Romania, it was terrible. Yeah. Uh, so, I was in all those places. It's like, and everybody's completely reliant on the government. Mm -hmm. One thing that's very important when people are forming their groups is who not to let in the groups. Yeah. Cowards are natural traitors. Yes. And that means moral or physical cowards. They are natural traitors. Select against. Good right? point. Good point. That, that's, a, that's a pretty good key takeaway because, you know, we had a lot of those in Ottawa. Yeah. Um, final thoughts. I'll, I'll leave it to you to, to close it off. All of our families have been through pandemic, famine, and war. There is nobody listening or watching this who doesn't come from a long family line of people that have been in a lot of war and pandemic and famine, and we're still sitting there, right? Right. And it's going to get rough. Uh, there's always people that see it coming, by the way. I've noticed that mm -hmm. in study, especially study of, uh, of, of famine and war. No, they might not see famines if they're coming like through a volcanic eruption or something. Mm -hmm. But the ones who come in, in, the, in the form that this one is coming are these group of famines. It'll clearly be some amalgam of things. But uh, there's always people that see them coming. One is a famous Japanese guy named Kenjiro. He's uh, often been my screensaver on my phone. Mm -hmm. He saw a famine coming a couple hundred years ago in Japan warned everybody got everybody prepared at first they thought he was kind of kooky but mm -hmm. he got them to stop growing you know rice and start growing millet and all these different things and they mm -hmm. did fine actually right but whereas a lot of others starved to death mm -hmm. so i mean there's all, what i've found in my study of famine is there's again not the sudden famines that happen with like a volcanic eruption but but the ones who, that come through other mechanisms there's always some group that see it coming and then there's a smaller subset of that group that actually takes action right like Japanese building fish ponds mm -hmm. and growing garlic around the fish ponds and things like right. that, you know. Right, right. Anyway, with that, it's been probably a couple hours, I'd imagine, by now. Um, but with that, I really want to thank you. And thank you, sir. And it's been a really interesting couple days just getting to yeah, know you and hearing all the stories. Thank so you. thank you for everything. I appreciate it. Yeah, keep working hard. I will. Thank you. Not general. He was a general. Then he was a colonel. And then he was... A prisoner in Afghanistan. That was the weirdest thing ever. How did he go from being a Canadian general mm. to a prisoner? That's an untold story. Yeah, I bet. It yeah. was in the news when he was put in prison, so you can see oh, okay. it in the news. Okay. It's on the nice. newspaper. Nice. Yeah. Okay. I mean, actually, everything I've told you, if you hunt and peck, you could find it. Yeah. I mean, there's a little few, few little details you couldn't find, like the right. Filipinos laying on the floor wounded or whatever, but... But the general things like the truck bomb and on the bridge and then the truck bomb that blew up Steve's house and then right. and then Menard with his corporal and oh, yeah. that's all reduced in rank to colonel, sent back on the same airplane with her. That's all in the news. Wow. That you know, um, that he was then went back as a contractor and got arrested okay. in Afghanistan and went to jail, all in the news. Wow. In an Afghan prison. Okay. Good. You can't even make up that.